Okay, so brief pause over. Yeah. Uh, just sorry to, to further clarify on that point. Um, there's like six versions of the Belgian uh, Mauser carbine. Mm-hmm. And then during the war, they go, uh oh, and they've turned everything into 16. And then after the war, they keep turning everything into 16. So now all those other variants, which were actually the ones that saw the most fighting, mm-hmm. I don't have any photos of. Right. So I would have to arrange to get over to probably a Belgian museum that has them mm-hmm. and just to photograph them. And that's one section of one part of the book to kind of cover everything. So my whole dream of having this sort of like everything World War One photo book right. is stuck on really like certain subsects of like, say, the Belgian carbines like mm-hmm. that. But then there's a lot of stuff like the Serbian guns. There's there's several Serbian guns we've never been able to cover that don't seem to even ex- one of which doesn't seem to exist in the U.S. Right. The few that do are held by someone who doesn't want to loan them. So. There's just that sort of element to it. Mm-hmm. Um, we might be able to get them for photography, but we're not going to be able to get them for demonstration. Right. So, yeah. All right. What's the next one? Uh, this is from Story. Uh, what was the most annoying slash tedious gun to get ready to shoot? Um, so, so far for us, the most annoying and the most tedious. It we've said it many times. Well, no, we actually have said it many times. It's all the black powder stuff. Not the true. episode production. Not true. What do you mean not true? Not true. Okay. Well, what's the most? Combly. Because making the ammo was... That was a lot for David, yeah. yeah the combine was a huge pain. And there's been some others that have had really hinky ammo that's that's a real pain in the ass. Oh, remember I was trying to get him trying to get that C96 available for us to shoot? Oh, like my God. On the one, one where they sold us the one with the roached boar and we trusted them enough yeah. not to double check it. Yeah. And then I was they like, like, why the isn't it cycling? And the boar was just... It was fitting Oh, I got as walls. far as... I'm so stupid that I got as far as running... Because, you know, I just, put a, I just pulled a patch through there and went, okay, clean it, and I went through. And I didn't stop and go, wait a second, why is that so big? Like, all I did was just check, like, I should have known, mm-hmm. but it was such a high price item and such a, well quote, unquote, renowned. reputable seller. Yes. That, by the way, this it was blah, about the fact check. that. Oh, yeah, no, they yeah, were completely oh, yeah. like, screw you. Oh, 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 it's not our fault. You know, like, what are you talking? We don't, it, actually, their exp- their Well, excuse- their description in there actually said the bore was pristine. No, they said a pristine bore. Yeah. Uh, it was roached, number one. Mm-hmm. But number two. The answer to everything was like, well, we didn't expect people to go out and shoot them. And it's just like, that doesn't change the fact that you lied about the boar. You right. S- anyway, sorry. Um, there have been bigger headaches, yes, mm-hmm. in terms of preparing. But once you're on range, it's all the black powder stuff. Oh, yeah, that just ends up the, taking the black powder range stuff and, on range. and research for you. <laughs> we had, we were trying to film the Dragoons that hasn't even released yet. But in the Dragoons, we went out for the first film day on them, mm-hmm. and we had the b- bullets, and we had gotten the mold. Arizgon Bullet Mold did us a huge favor helping us track down some of their molds that yep. weren't even available. They did a great job with that. Um, but we sent the mold straight to Kevin first, mm-hmm. because he was like, no, 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 I want to cast for you, blah, blah, blah. And then he got distracted, Kevin. <laughs> but he was like, no, I'm definitely doing these bullets. So he makes this pile of bullets, right? And, and they're, like, they're beautiful. Oh, I love Kevin. They look right? beautiful. So I go out, and I try to load them, and uh, I had to, like, I had to like bore one out back out, because it's like, what the hell is this under? And he it had made like them out of. The I don't know what he used. Hardest lead. It was so hard it would not. You. I mean, I about thought I, mean, I was going to break beautiful. the loading. I, I thought I was going to break the loading lever. I thought you were too. I thought we were just going. We were going to be done with the episode. And of course, you're like once it's partially in there, you're like, uh oh. So you had to like hammer it in and shoot it back out. Right. And that one shot made the bore so hot. Like I was right. just like. Oh God, these are dangerous. Like right. they're so There's hard. No way. So like that whole day was lost because we thought we had bullets. Because who'd have thought that you Kevin would cast them and out of like steel? Out of like Superman steel. It's like so, he put Superman blood into it. I, mean, I was sitting there going, "What the hell is?" Going? They were so, they were beautiful though. They looked amazing. Yeah, could so, not use them. Uh, it's always ammo. It's really yeah. the ammo that becomes the problem. Um, but in general, excluding the ammo aspect of just something being weird or hard. It's uh, trying to just be- the black powder stuff in general is so yeah. slow to get ready and shoot. It's a pain in the butt. Um, all right, what's this one? Uh, from Michael for the Q and A. Thinking of all the weapons you've handled for the show, which ones are the worst and why? I think we've kind of really covered that. No, we haven't really. Um, to be fair, he said he's like uh, he kind of quoted, "I'd rather go into battle with a pointed stick than trust my life to that." I can't think of any other so bad I would take a stick. No, not even the Reich's revolver. I'd still take a Reich's revolver over a stick. Right. Um, Unless any, it was a dangerous pistol, like I thought it was going to explode or Romanians, something like that. The Spanish made Romanian 1915. Mm-hmm. Uh, the broad majority of them that I have encountered have literally shattered, cracked, or missing forcing cones. I remember cones. that, yep. 
Almost all of them. Let's get the screw on top of most it. Most of them don't have forcing cones anymore because they have broken off. Right. Which is terrifying. Because um, that's hot metal. Yeah. There's uh right With your hand, your meat stick fingers. I forgot what I was thinking about now. There was um. Well, it is any of the single now actions, almost 1 a.m. Yeah, one of the, any of the single actions, not great. And then for rifle-wise, the only thing I can think of that was really, like, awful, awful was the Vetterly that exploded in my face. Oh, yeah, the Vetterly explosions. Well, yeah. and then we had the other one that cracked a bolt. Yeah, two. So Vetterlies are officially... Uh, out of two Vetterlies, we had two of them fail mechanically, and then we had to hybrid them and then really work the ammo down to make sure that we didn't have problems again. Right. And even then, if you watch it, I think it's the venting gas. Yeah. Like, it's not... It's not perfect. No. By any means, and it not never perfect. Will. Yeah, the, and then I have people. By the way, I, three times, four times a year, I have people be like, "I still shoot my better and I use this lead." It's like, like, okay, you're going to no, good luck. No, it, hey, it, then yours is in better shape than the two that I got, which were the only two I got. Yep. Um, the, you got good job, like, but not for me. Like, yeah, not a fan. Mm -mm. So. <laughs> I mean, the old 10.4 better lease, I'll shoot them all day. They were fine. Like, we yeah. had no problems with that one. Oh, sure. But, all right. All right. This one's from Will. Uh, with all the single shots or the rare repeating conversions there from, uh, you've handled through the series. What was the best based off of handling and the best uh, for mass issue? Okay, so best single shot handling wise. Um... I personally enjoyed two, um, and it's kind of hard for me to pick my favorite because they're actually pretty equal in terms of the aesthetic appeal of them. Aesthetic? No, we're talking about handling. Oh, just handling in general? He Probably. says handling. Like, which one would you want to have to get in a fight with, I think? And they're single shots. Yeah. Um, probably the rolling block is the best one. I don't think so. No. You think the Vernal? No. Oh, wait, are we, wait, maybe like single shot bolt action because there's like the 71s and stuff like that. I think the, the 71, 71 84. and the Gra. Uh, there's the both of the bolt action metallic right, cartridge. I think was not it's 71, yeah. The bolt the, the the bolt action center fire metallic cartridge single shot rifles. Yes. Are faster. The Berdan. Inherently so. Berdan also good. If it was uh, now ours work, ran yeah. a little light because it's hard to make Berdan ammo just right, but a brand new Berdan. Yeah. Actually, you know, if I had to pick one to bet my life on, mm -hmm. and it was and I was given it in good condition, mm -hmm. like with proper ammo, sure. I'd probably pick the Berdan out of even the Graw and the um, wow. Mauser because the Berdan had really good ballistics. Mm -hmm. That 4.2, as far as I'm aware, was a very good cartridge. Neat. Um, so, like, but the bolt action center fires tend to be the ones that I prefer. Mm -hmm. uh, and because they're the fastest so far in terms of just click, flop, click, boom, you know. So then what's better for mass issue? Uh, rolling block. Oh, really? Just because of the simplicity? Yeah, rolling blocks were very affordable and very simple. And then also, if we're talking about for mass issue, when you're going into the era of early breech loaders, mm -hmm. the rolling block is almost impossible to accidentally shoot yourself with. Because you have to cock it back, open up the thing, and then it's locked at the moment that it falls, and it's just... The rolling block has a very, like, direct action that, that really stupid people understand. Mm -hmm. okay, like, really sure. poorly yeah, educated on firearms people still don't shoot themselves with rolling blocks. Yeah. I agree. So, yeah, that, those are my picks. I get that. All right, let's see here. This is from Stenrod. What's your favorite historical Scandinavian gun? We don't have a lot of Scandinavian What's guns. What's your favorite Scandinavian gun? I don't gun? have I can name it. What are you talking about? What's, are you... Sweden is in Scandinavia. Yeah. Oh. Norway is in Scandinavia. Yeah. Denmark is in Scandinavia. Well, if we're talking like Norwegian, can I? Finland's in Scandinavia, but we don't. We haven't done that yet, and uh, Iceland doesn't really have. So, white like green Norwegian ones. crags would be pretty rad. Yeah, Norwegian Those crags. Are, I tend right. to like the Norwegian crags a okay. lot, actually. More so than Swedish Mausers? Uh, no. Okay, Swedish so we're already pretty good. Yeah, no. So the long rifle, the carbine. Carbine's better. Okay, because yeah. I was going to say the 9414 is one of your favorite yeah, things you've shot. It's been a while. Then we're yeah. just slowly getting our way back to it, apparently. <laughs> Not the Danish It's been cracks. a long night, okay? It's, it's been almost five hours. <laughs> You're lucky I remember who I am and who you are. Uh, he doesn't say that we've covered for the show. So no, he does not. So you could include Finnish Mosins that you've shot? Well, yeah, but Mosins in general, like, there's a, a whole category. You prefer the Swedish Mauser? Yeah. Okay. Um... For what me, about you? Yeah. my favorite is one we haven't gotten the cover yet. Um, it's another Danish because I told you I've been doing some Danish revolver digging. Mm -hmm. um, that I managed to get a hold of what's called a Danish 1891 naval revolver. Oh, yes, you did. Mm -hmm. And we showed it on one of our other things. 
but it is a left hand. It has a it has a manual safety on the right side. So it's specifically oh. a left hand military revolver. And it's a ambidextrous top break based on the Laveau system. Huh. And it has this really weird takedown method, which we've shown before. Why a left handed? Because uh, your cutlass would go on your right. Or I think they call it like a saber cutlass. It was sort of a weird hybrid sword. Mm. But um, Makes sense. I love that gun so much mm -hmm. that I ended up digging around for months and months and months to try to find someone selling the uh, the naval sword. Yeah. And thankfully, nobody cares about Danish naval stuff, so it was cheap. Uh -huh. So I was just like, hooray! <laughs> like, cause I, like, I was like this really obscure left hand only sword, and I found the little cutlass that goes with it. So now I can just be like, all right, I got the playset. And like, but I just really love how, like, to my knowledge, it is the only uh, purpose designed left handed military revolver. It might be the only revolver that's even really all that friendly to being left handed. If mm -hmm. you think about the others, they all had some sort of setup. I mean, yeah. accidentally, the French 1892 is, and that the doctrine was to switch the hand. But in, in the actual effect, you end up being able to just use it like a left-handed person would use it. You argue a lot of top breaks are ambidextrous. Yeah. I mean, I get this is inherently ambidextrous, too. Right. Just inherently so. Like, there's nothing Yeah, but imagine really you took screams. this and put a safety over here so that if you held it in your right hand, it would be weird. Right. Because it's actually weird. There's nothing that I think that would specifically scream, hold this in your left hand. Yeah. So I like that little gun. Fair. Uh... Okay. I also nice. like the, the way Danes count. Did you know about that? Uh, you told me about that, but you can tell them. They count in scores. Yeah, it's weird. I didn't know that. And it, it seems How very dangerous. How do they Danish interact with the rest of the world? It's like, I think it's like, they get to like, they get to 40 or something like that. Uh -huh. Like, it's like, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then mm -hmm. like 20, 30, 40, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I think they do it for 50, but I know they do it for 60, mm -hmm. which is like 60 is like they go three score, mm -hmm. but they drop the score. So they just call it threes, which, yes. okay, fine. Sure. Three score is three times 20, 60, right? Uh -huh. But then apparently they don't like, you'd think half three score would be 30, mm -hmm. but no, because they just think of it as being halfway between, I guess, 40 and 60. Mm -hmm. So, and I might be talking about my ass, but this is how it was told to me is that then 50 is half threes because you're halfway to threes from 40, I think. If anybody's Danish, correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, it's really funny because it's like 20, 30, 40, half threes, threes, half fours, fours. What the hell is going on? Also, I don't think the other Scandinavians do it. I think it's just the Danes, which is just even more confusing for people. I still don't know how they interact with the world then so easily. They must think everyone else is weird. From everything I've been told, the Danes are some of the weirdest of the, like, the um, linguistically related uh, Scandinavians. Because Finland mm -hmm. has its... They're Scandinavian, but they, they don't use the same root language. Ah. But apparently the Danes are, like, the really weird ones. Okay. Linguistically. Mm. So... Uh, let's see here. This next one is from Luke. Not related to the Great War, but what are your favorite small arms um, from the Cold War? Okay, what's your favorite small arm from the Cold War? Well, um, I do have that VZ-58. Mm -hmm. Back when they were good. cheap? Yeah. That's actually one of my oldest ones from my collection, I think. My yeah, own we personal traded it collection. for another one, though. Yeah, I know. Which subbed it for a different VZ-58. I know. But... Um, but that yeah. one's been one of my favorites. I used to take it out all the time. May love that thing so much that I found a guy in Czechoslovakia that had the little um, bipod bayonet mount. I know. Mount. That Those thing are is rare. great. They're and fun they to click on. Yeah, they're so expensive and rare. And I was just like, somebody else got it. So I went digging. There's a guy in Czechoslovakia that had them. So I was just like, well, I can wait for shipping. Yeah. So I ordered some stuff through him for inexpensive. And it showed up. And I was like, jackpot. Mm -hmm. And then, like, I think a buddy of mine managed to buy his last one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because, God, they're expensive in the U.S. But oh, I know. It's got the weird little bipod on the thing. It's super and, cute. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun. The VZ-58 rifle, not the pistol. Yeah, obviously. the rifle. Um, what about you? <sighs> probably the foul. I mean, you have been pretty foul focused. I really, like, the parts kits got too expensive. I had a foul project in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and now I can't do it. I'm sorry. I really needed, like, I have a SAR 4800, so it's not like a special foul. I got mm -hmm. it back when they were not expensive. Mm -hmm. So much of my collection is really old because it's from when things weren't expensive. Right. But um, So now your perception of what, I mean, if you weren't having to watch the market already as is, you'd be like, what the hell happened? It's, it's very weird how 
I, I actually buy more infrequently now mm-hmm. because I have to save up a lot more to try to get things because I don't yeah. I don't necessarily get paid what I got paid even before I did the show. Right. And back then things were cheaper. Uh-huh. So it's like I have to be so much more careful. When I have to focus on more things like f- making weird ammos for revolvers that haven't seen the light of yeah, day um, in like a decade or two. But I do have a foul. And, uh, I mean, it's just a star 4800, like I said, mm-hmm. but I found out that the Dutch pattern is very closely related to South American pattern mm-hmm. with some minor changes, but they're significant that you have to mill and cut things. So I really wanted to get some of those SAR, uh, the South American style, um, parts kits mm-hmm. and they were cheap and cheap and cheap and I didn't have the money. And then they shot up to 900 bucks and I really didn't have the money and now they're on Obtanium. So now like. I'm sitting there going, uh, but like the one thing I managed to get before all that happened is I did get the unobtainium Dutch wood buttstock. Mm-hmm. So it's like if I could just get the dang parts kit, I could then mill and cut and do some of the things I needed to do and do like a reproduction sort of Dutch style I one. Know, it which is really like the cool. one nobody has because nobody now I know a bunch of guys are going, wait, there's a Dutch pattern. Mm-hmm. And it's cool. It has like a Carney eight style front hood. It has a proprietary mag release. Mm-hmm. Um I was going to try to get, like, as naked a receiver as I get and laser on the Dutch emblem. Mm-hmm. It was just going to be cool, but uh, just uh, no money. I'm sorry. So, But I do like my foul. Um, I understand that it's impractical, by the way, compared to, like, the, I know people are going to be G3 and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I get it. It's, like, it's one of those guns that got shoved into doing something it wasn't supposed to do originally, and it, it has some length issues that really don't need to be there. But mm-hmm. the foul, to me, is everything the show shot wanted to be. Like it's like the, the foul is the ultimate show shot. Nobody wants to admit that. <laughs> um, let's take a pause with the cameras. Okay. Uh, this one is from Timo. When do we stop? By the way, when do we just stop and decide that Never. your, your we, bottom is, hurts too much for the, us to keep going? You guess the little bubble is still at the top of the thing somehow. I know, but that's because I've been deleting everything, so it's like, yeah. I know it's the bubble is no slowly getting bigger. It is now 1 a.m. No, it's 1, but also my buddy Tom sent me a text message. Oh, so what did he say? I sent him a picture of a gun. Okay. So, Tom is my old revolver buddy, so... Yeah, and this one is from Timo. Okay. Okay. Uh, how many finished guns do you have in your collection? Not a lot. No, not a lot. I mean, we, we just had kind of weirdly had this conversation. Yeah, weirdly we were talking about that. We had um, some, like, 91 sitting some around. Of, some of these, I think maybe even both of these 91s are... Neither one of them, I believe, are SA marked, but both of them had the fin style cancellation and remarks of the rear sights. Right. And then uh, you were gifted an M28. Yes, I was a few years ago. That was yes. nice. Yes. Uh, Thank and you. I think. I think it was John. Yes. I used to own an M27, but I'm pretty sure I sold it. And the Thank reason you? I hesitate to say that is that there's a handful of World War II things that we just didn't have to liquidate, and they're sitting in literally a Mosin crate that's. Buried under other stuff in the room. They're well protected. Yeah, it's just I haven't been in that crate in like six months, but it's sitting there waiting for us to start kind of covering that period. And then honestly, I'm going to like cover them in episodes and then liquidate them again. Mm -hmm. Although that goes to, we had this conversation on our podcast. Um, Ian got in trouble, not in trouble, but people got mad at Ian because he talked about a gun before selling it. Mm Mm-hmm. Which they thought was a pump and dump, but he didn't say, at least I don't think he said that he was going to sell it. He just happened to sell it after talking about it. Mm-hmm. And so I'm always scared of that because it's like, well, wait a second. I, I have some stuff laying around that I literally only held on to so we could do the episodes more easily. And then I was going to sell them gonna because I don't need it. Episode. I mean, to be fair, so, that's what happens with the loner situation. And we get the gun in, we use it for the episode, and we don't. We don't have it for longer than that, and then we get it back. Which I mean, technically, there may be pumping. If you own a gun, you send it to us, and you think that it's going to get more valuable by sending it to us, then I guess we're already doing well, it. Well, only more knowledge about the pieces is only going to increase their collector value. Or help, uh, it, or help it weather a storm if it was going to sink for some reason. That's true. I don't know. Anyway. Um, yeah, we do have just a, couple. Uh, just a few. Yeah, not that many. Not so many. Yeah. Mm-mm. Okay, uh, what's next? This one's from Nicholas. Looking forward from World War One. are there any or maybe just a top couple uh, firearms that you would take into World War Two? So, like, World War One firearms we would take into World War Two. I think that's what he means. Uh, a lot of them that we would take probably did go in there. So, handgun-wise, 1911. Yeah, that definitely went along. Fine. Like, um... Uh, the, we talked about this before, but essentially, what is the Browning 1917 stuck around? I don't think it would have been all that out of date by World War II. Yep. Now, uh, things like the MP18 with some slight improvements, that would obviously... It would have been, I don't think an MP18 would have been drastically worse than an MP40 or something like mm-hmm. that. You know what I mean? It's not like... 
It's not huge. It's not ideal because you got that thing sticking off the side, but it's not like it's going to ruin your ability to fight with it. Right. Um, out of light machine guns, it's pretty much the Lotus is the only thing that has a hope of being usable in World mm -hmm. War II, and even then it's pretty far behind. Right. Uh, and <laughs> the then, U.S. brought along the VAR. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, that was not a good move, and people oh, really hate admitting God. that. So, uh, yeah. Okay. All right, this one, next one is from Shishi. Yeah. I'm guessing that's how you pronounce that. Uh -huh. uh, if you were to have an unlimited access to any museum and to any local food, food you want, where would you travel? All, All expenses. expenses paid. So any museum and any food. So is it like so the you problem, have to have both? The problem with that is they assume we eat food when we're at a museum. Oh, they assume we eat when we work. We forget so, to eat when we work because we're because working. This, because this schedule, the last... Your just stomach just crumble at that. The last actual museum tri trip we took was like out to Cody. Mm -hmm. And May and I shift drove for 32 hours. Yeah. And ate whatever the hell was at the gas station. Uh-huh. Because that there was, was good. no time. The first one you had to pee, they lost. Yeah. So May and I will literally sleep for six hours while the other one drives for six hours. And that's it. So yeah. there's there's no... The problem is people think when we make those trips that there's vacation time in there. Oh, there's none. There's none. We don't... Because the trip itself has then consumed anything that might have resembled a vacation for six months around it. Because right. of the, the show production that goes into the vacation. Yeah, so that is our goal. We yeah. go there to accomplish our goal, and then we get back home as fast as we possibly can. Yes. There's no straggling. No. So as far as the food goes, we just don't tend to... Yeah, food and local that. tourism yeah. have nothing to do with anything. No. And we make a lot of people mad because they're just like, but you're here, you should take an hour. And they're like, no... We barely, like, we're holding on by our fingernails. We got to get back. Like, we we have to drive home so we don't sleep tonight so we can finish the work to do the episode that pays the bills that let us come out here. Bah. And it's just, it's it's really bad. We're bad travelers in that regard. <laughs> there And everybody goes, you should just take a break. And it's like, yeah, you do that. Because this Q&A already, I guarantee you, we're going to lose $200 that we'll never make back up on the back end. Like, it just, it keeps happening. Um, but what okay a limited access to the museum though so if you could pick any museum in the world and you have a limited access to it I haven't been to all of them so you don't know what's there right I literally don't know which one I would pick because I don't know what they have do you know out of the ones you know like if you had to pick one of the museums right now that you know of that you well the problem is I picked the one that I know best that I haven't been to which was I know a lot of the inventory in Royal Armories sort of by talking to Jonathan mm -hmm. and I know I could get a lot of work done there um because I know what's in inventory that we haven't been able to photograph or work with. Right, but that's just what you know of. So. Right, and the problem is a lot of that I also could probably find redundantly elsewhere if there was a... Um, there's certain European collections that I know of through little nods from friends, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I actually don't know their actual inventory, and it's very hard for someone to express that to you because what's on display in collections or what's listed online is not always what they have. Right. Um there's probably, you know, in Belgium or something, there may be a museum that has almost everything I need to finish up the book. Yeah. But I probably won't find that in the Royal Armories necessarily because I don't think they have a full set of Dutch or uh, Belgian carbines. Mm -hmm. So if, if the Royal Armories doesn't have a full set of Belgian carbines, but this other place does, then. But then. The, but both of them have 98% of this other stuff I need, and then when I come back, I can find the other 2%. So that's the problem is the that he's going to... Yeah. Yeah. Although I, I can almost guarantee that it, if even if it's like a museum that you're unaware of or whatever, it's not going to be here in the United States. It's going to be a foreign museum. No, at this point, yes. I'm, I'm fairly... I'm fairly certain I've seen just about everything there is to see in the United States. And while there are some stuff here that you would and could definitely use photos of. Oh, no, I, I could. We, we hit Springfield hard. I could go back to Springfield and spend another two whole days just photographing. I'd say like probably a week we could probably do it. And that would honestly definitely guarantee not just full sets photos, but feature photos and things like that. that I don't think I could get it done in do. a week just unless if I wanted to take everything of relevance there, photograph it. Mm -hmm. It would take me a month. And that's just Springfield, but the problem is, if we're talking about World War One relevance, okay, yeah, like in a, probably about forty-eight hours, really pushing it, I could get what I need out I of could, Springfield yeah. photography. Because a lot of it's stuff that a lot of ibuprofen. A lot of it's stuff that we've missed a certain photo of while we were there the first time. Or the photo that one of the photos out of the four set just came out blurry. Yeah, but that was a mad dash. Oh yeah. Um, we were ever, young and desperate back if then. If you're ever up at the Springfield National Historic Site, do not hesitate to say thank you to um, Alex McKenzie for hosting us. By the way, because that was insanity and he was very sweet he was a very kind man let us take a lot of photos and honestly he was a wonderful host yeah 
Okay, what we got? We got seven pages left, right? All right, that's actually not too bad. We're halfway through. Was it eight? Wait, it was what? 14 pages. <laughs> this is why I looked at him in the beginning and I was like, we're taking, he's taking a long time on some of these. Okay, and I knew so what was going to happen. I know. You we just, you went too far or? in your little, little ski, whatever scenarios. All right. Uh, this is from Kevlar and Chrome. Your opinion. What's the best reproduction black powder revolver for someone who wants to start in that area for not a huge amount of money? We've actually been doing a lot of this, so you are quite familiar with it. Walker. <laughs> No, the I best spit one. Spit on myself a little bit. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I laughed so hard I spit on myself. <laughs> that? I don't know why. It's that time of the night, folks. I know. Oh my god. I'm tired. Oh, uh, I need to get a drink out of this. Okay. So, um, like a drink? No, like a soda pop. Okay. I don't actually. I'm not a heavy drinker. It's true. He's not. Um, I'm the one who'll have a glass. I'm not of wine against here it. I just not a heavy drinker. Like it just. Yeah. I don't know why. Um. I forget what I was saying. Usually by the time I drink enough to get anywhere with it, I get a tummy ache. Or you get sleepy and you take a nap. Yeah, I'm also not a very relaxed drunk. No. Like, I get when I get to really drinking, I realize that I'm inebriated, and then... He just um, kind of sits there and stares. Yeah, well, then people are like, hey, what are you doing? And I'm just, like, being careful. And they're like, what? And I'm like, my, I'm, I'm, uh, my walls are down. Yes. I'm not thinking clearly about what I'm saying. Uh-huh. I refuse to expose my thoughts and actions. <laughs> He's like, what? And I'm like, I'm giving you nothing. <laughs> he just turns up the paranoia to 10. He's yeah, because like, I know Be I'm paranoid. not. No, because everybody I've ever known that is like, they always get loose when they're drunk and then they make a fool of themselves or they like rub somebody the wrong way. And so uh -huh. I'm just like, I've been drinking and I can no longer be trusted to be an adult. So I'm going to sit know here is, real quiet. is that I had too much wine one evening at one of our hosting events. And I had apparently a very lovely conversation with a Russian woman for over an hour. And she thought I was amazing. And I don't remember a thing I said. I think she was Ukrainian, actually. Yes. Oh, wait, she was Ukrainian. That's very offensive these days. <laughs> we haven't even answered the question. Okay. Anyway, um, black powder revolvers? Yeah. So Maybe that's easy to get. Reproductions? Yeah. Um, so presently, I have been a little unimpressed with the quality of the Pietas, I believe is the ones I'm thinking of. Ubertis are no, good. Piet, no, Pietas. Because the Ubertis have been in good quality. Mm -hmm. um, if you want something a little nicer, I believe you can go through Taylor's and Company. I think so, yeah. They have some dressed up, like, more hand select. I think they're still Uberti made, but I think they're just... Per, they're just the... Primo. Yeah. Um, and they and also more have more picked. customer care, I believe, than just sort of buying it wherever you can find it. Mm -hmm. If you're at, like, the Cabela's, I think it's, like, a Pieta, and I just, I bought one out of a Cabela's just to see. Right. And it, mm. Isn't that where you went to go buy one, and the first one you picked up, it was missing, like, a piece from the yep. loading lever? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 That was funny. And then the next one I picked up, it just felt The guy sloppy. was just like, wait, you want to see it out of the box? Well, yeah, I want to see it real quick. Oh, okay, that's really No, he was weird. really, he's like, no, 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 and I pulled it out, I was like, well, this one's missing a piece, and he went, is it? And I was like... It's a good thing I asked. Right. Anyway, so um, I would recommend Uberti probably as a good starter company. Um, if we're talking about reproduction, you basically have two choices for the easy ones, mm -hmm. which is the Colt 1851 or the 1860. Can't go um, on there. It's really whether you want, uh, you know, 36 or 44. Um, for me personally, I prefer the 44s. I tend to be able to find the 454 lead balls more readily. Fair. I don't know why, but I just sort of see them on shelves more often. Mm, maybe um, it's just not as common. Or yeah. not as uh, common for people to be shooting them. No, it would be more common. Well, that, well no, I mean, you just mean... Because oh, they're unstocked. Right, because they're restocked more. Okay. Yeah, sure. I'm not that deep into black powder, so I suspect there's probably some rifles and stuff or some modern stuff that uses a similar bore. Um, I know, obviously, it carries over into forty five and blah, blah, blah. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I tend to have an easier time with the forty four than thirty six. Um Obviously, 36 would be lighter mm -hmm. on recoil and stuff yeah. like that, but I just prefer it for it. So I'd say, like, I would highly recommend just grabbing an 1860. Anybody that wants to get into it, the 1860s are cheap enough, usually, uh, that you, like the Uberti made ones, just mm -hmm. go grab one. You're not, like, even when we start to see them into, like, the, like, three $400 range, mm -hmm. you're just not going to be disappointed you know, right. that. Right. For three, and then you get for to three or four bills, that's not bad. Oh, my God. Ah, this chair is attacking my buttocks. Um, I'm gonna miss I you. Have it here. The other thing that you get to do is you get to put together like a cool possible bag. Watch out for your mic. Yeah, I know. I'm bagging it. everything. So like, I, I got this at a gun show. Super yeah. nice guy. Good uh -huh. leather. Um, 
I really like it. I believe there's a site online that carries these things too. That's they're really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, you get to have you your, can accessorize. You get to have your little hammer. Yeah. You get to pick out a flask that you like with mm -hmm. like multiple tips for whatever you know loads oh, you want to do. Yeah, look at that little weave um, on it too. I'm going to tell you, it, I highly recommend black powder shooting as a hobby, muzzle loading black powder shooting. Mm -hmm. I highly recommend it as a hobby. If you're the kind of person that wants to have a little zen in your life, yeah, because you go out and you have to t you have to do it outside mm -hmm. because no, the indoor range hates you. Nope. They don't yep. want that. They don't want that in their filtration system. Um, you have to go outside. They're perfectly good, especially the pistols at short ranges, so you don't need a lot of range. Mm -hmm. The sound is fantastic. Oh yeah, you can't get at that throaty sound that comes with them. It's yeah. wonderful. The ammunition is inexpensive, and you don't go through a lot of it because you're sitting there. You get the a lot. plume that comes from the black powder is beautiful. The smell of it is wonderful. And it's necessary, right? Mm -hmm. It's a little weird to go to a gun range and like have a modern, well, modern a cartridge revolver, let's mm -hmm. say. And the game to reload this thing is it's all been optimized. So it's like I open it up and I load my six rounds mm -hmm. and then I close the gun up and then I present and I might take a deep breath and I might slowly pull single action or maybe double action or something, right? You're but just it's, mimicking me now. But it's going to go fast and it's going to go at a buck around. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then with the black powder stuff, I'm not paying a buck around. No, definitely not. And if you are, you overpaid. I'm sitting outside and I, yeah, okay, the shooting part is about as fast. Mm -hmm. But then when I'm done, it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, you start the whole process again and you're getting to do something repetitive and pleasant. Mm -hmm. And you're really interacting with your firearm in a way that you have to interact with it. Yeah. And you're burning some hobby time. It's a little more intimacy. At lower cost, with right? The gun. More hobby time, lower cost. It's very fun. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you get back, you have to clean the crap out of it. Hold oh, on. yeah. You Moose gotta... milk all the way. So dilute yeah. ballast all in water, shake it up. D d d Dry really, it when you're done <laughs> me, heavily. Also, these are inexpensive guns. They can be a very good way to teach you how to properly clean a gun. Because That's true. If you forget a nook or cranny to clean out, it will tell you. If you have a black powder muzzle loader, clean it and then come back two weeks later, mm -hmm. and you will find out how bad at cleaning you were. Well, it may be two days, depending on the humidity yeah, of the true. area. Yeah, but, uh, oh, they'll tell you how bad you are. I oh, really yeah. recommend the hobby. Um, everybody should have at least one muzzle-loading black powder and a little kit. It's fun. Mm -hmm. All right, let's answer this one, then take another break. Okay. All right, this one's from Aiden. Your favorite most referenced gun books. I summarize this question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, favorite most referenced for, well, technically this might be just you because I was oh, doing like yeah, bolt yeah. actions of the world essentially yeah. back in the day. There's some generics when you're first starting out, like that was pretty good military one. rifles of the yeah. world or handguns of the world by Ezel. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's a few reference books that I kind of go to like, um, Mueller's book on revolvers was a big help for me getting started, but now I've kind of moved beyond it in some regards and he's not. He, he was writing in the 90s, so it's like, he did great, but it's there's still stuff to be done. Right, it's still limited. Um, but it's so topic-based is the problem for you. No, there's nothing that I go back to continuously, although there is one older one. You know what? Let me, uh, we're on number 14, aren't we? Let's see. Yeah. So let me do this 14, timestamp me. Uh, you're at 6, 1707. 1707. Uh, there is one book for Austrian guns that I've gone back to a lot. Oh, yes. That book is I fantastic. It's like, the Pistols book, right? The big one? Yeah. It's, um... I can't remember. It's too generic it's and like it's in Austrian. It's basically like, ar no, it's like, no, it's like, yeah, it's like hand weapons of the Austrian army or something right. like that, but it's so generic. And I can literally think of two more books that have, so the names are so similar that when I go to pull them, and there's, yeah, there's two I like them, look at them and go, oh crap, which title was it? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Cause uh, we'll not pull them, but I have, I have text translations that, cause we, we OCR and no, I won't give you a copy of the book. That's the copyright violation, but I'll OCR the book for myself. So I have a mm -hmm. digital file. And so when I go to read the visual file, the name's so similar that I mix it up with another one. Right. So I'll put it on the screen somewhere in there. You've already Just seen it. Just to flash the title of the book. Um, but that's only for Austrian, and it's still not perfect because I know that book doesn't even mention the uh, 1888 90 mm -hmm. 95 rifle, right. which we know exists. Mm -hmm. um, and so that book's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Right. Uh, so, yeah. That's probably technically your most referenced, yeah. Okay. Um, let's, uh, in terms of recurring. It's not that I use it every day or anything, but yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take a break. All right. This next one is for Brian or from Brian. Uh, what has been your favorite primer episode? There is a lot more going on in this question, but I'm just going to stick with that top question. 
Mm. Because otherwise we'd be answering many, many questions for one person. Do you have a favorite primer? Um, you know what's weird is I probably would think of a favorite primer episode and one that I wouldn't necessarily even think of it as a favorite because it was probably so easy to accomplish <laughs> that it doesn't... I don't remember the easier ones. I remember the ones that kicked our butts just in terms of filming or I disliked the gun for whatever reason. I probably could stand redoing at this point, but I still kind of like the Ross. The Ross was sort of the first one where we hit that that rhythm. Mm -hmm. The Ross was actually pretty good. But even then, if you watch the Ross now, I could have been using a teleprompter. We could have made it a lot tighter. But mm -hmm. I think that's really one that stood out as being like the time where we sort of got ourselves going. Fair. I think I um, kind of like the Luger episodes that we redid. Those are pretty good. Yeah, they, they came out very nice. Very nice after I like the redone bodeos and then I immediately found something else out about the bodeo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how that goes. I was pretty happy to cover the 10.4 Swiss recently. Yeah, that was pretty good. The 78. Yeah, that was fun. But those are the ones that stand out right now. But also probably because I just did that one. But mm -hmm. I also just like the look of the gun. Yeah, it's so fun. you can like it. I'll, I'll, I'll um, I always just I always like showing off the guns that are like they were adopted, they were used. But they're still sort of forgotten. You mm -hmm. know, like Ian's got forgotten weapons. He gets to cover the weird stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. We cover a lot of normal stuff, and occasionally it's like, look at this fucking thing. Yes. <laughs> oh, you just said that for it. Now I gotta find no, no, that. No, 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 no. I just sort of. It's okay. Fine. All, right, all right. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. Everything's fine. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, sorry. We, we don't, unfortunately, have the time to go more than one at this point. <laughs> Not even before. All right. You're whispering because it's dark out. I am whispering because it's dark out. It's not dark in here. There's light. Okay. Uh, this one's from Alexander. How many more firearms do you still have in your backlog for World War One that you can confirm were issued to troops? That, we so kinda, that we can we confirm. We kind of cover this. It's, the machine guns and auto rifle stuff is bad. Yes. Like, we know we haven't gotten hands on, like, say, Fedorov off to that. Mm -hmm. We haven't gotten our hands VN. on several, yeah, there's several machine guns and auto rifles we haven't gotten a hold of. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately it's... There's some Serbian rifles we haven't gotten a hold of. Yep. And I don't know if we ever will. No, and then it sort of peters off pretty quickly after that. There's just a handful of handguns we haven't gotten a hold of. Mm -hmm. um, it's fairly small numbers, though. We're talking about... Borshart, things like that. Disregarding the autos, we're under a dozen. It's got to be. Yeah, I would like to think. But not including photography. Photography is a much larger number. That's different. So... Yeah. I think that's about it. Yeah, I think so. We're getting, we're pretty we're, close, but we're also all. We're doing a pretty good job of covering them. You say we're getting close, but we've also left. You know what I mean? Like, people forget that we really have left World War One. We haven't done a, we, we've done, you know, we say, we've what been. Was, what was the last World War One episode we had done? I don't know. I have to look at it now because we really. We redid the Reichs I mean, we did the Spanish so. Mausers. We did, that's not World War One. You know, we did, mm -hmm. we've been doing a lot of neutral stuff around the same period, sort of cleaning things up. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've also gone back in time. And a lot of people haven't noticed it as much because we went backwards in time and everybody expected us to jump into World War Two. Mm -hmm. But that's a lot. Right. That's a whole change up in research material and stuff like that. <clears throat> not only that, but when we go to World War Two, you're probably going to see us revisit the standards first. You're going to see, like, the Car 98s. And the short magazine Lee Enfields mm -hmm. before, because that's the ones that we have the most context for, and they're the least changed. Right. And then that way, that lead, leads us to some groundwork to be like, okay, but the Guerrero 43 is weird, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, it doesn't stand out as much unless you have that bedding of all the other stuff. Yeah. So, I'm frankly terrified of it. I'm so <laughs> terrified. <laughs> because it's, it's, there's more, there's much more innovation before rather than after. Yeah. But the other stuff is more iconic. We'll be easier to get a hold of, potentially. Oh, so way easier. That. Yeah. World War II machine guns, all day I'm off of Oh, that yeah. Stuff. So, um, but the... Now I got, watch, when you go to start doing them, they're just going to be like, oh, wait, no. No, the big hang up on that is going to be animation, because we can't just shove... Like, we were licensing machine gun animations from VBBYSMYT. VBBSMYT. Yeah. Um, but it's been a while since we've done that, number one. Mm -hmm. And number two... Uh, how the heck we'd have to get Bruno way ahead, mm -hmm. and then how's he gonna get all the dimensions on a oh, machine yeah, gun? That would it's be not, crazy, it's not necessarily here. Like, you think about it, and if we're doing it in house with the one animator because mm -hmm. we, we haven't grown enough to have another animator, then how the heck are we gonna do a machine gun more than once every like six months, right? Um, because people are getting excited, but it's like, well, hold on, because the machine guns you really gotta animate, mm -hmm. and that's gonna be. 
really heavy. Now, if we could grow the show, we could get a backup animator and we could put somebody to work just doing machine guns mm-hmm. on like a like maybe like a one a month or one every six weeks kind of mm-hmm. thing. And then that would get us built up to be able to do those guns in the future. But that would require some more effort. Right. Um, so this one uh, is from Mateo. Um, and he asked a few questions, so we'll just answer the first one. Uh, oh, okay. uh, Primer, he references episode 91, uh, timestamp 3811. Any updates on it? So for that one, remember that stupid big revolver that you had that it was... Yeah, yeah, yeah the gas. Yeah, it, yeah, was yeah, a yeah. Pri- it was a price... It was a gasser in the sense that it was like some sort of 11 millimeter Belgian something that people thought went to my Montenegro with a big old barrel. And then it has a price type pinch and open lock. Mm-hmm. But it was made out of bubble gum. Right. Um, the interesting thing about that gun is very recently I gave it away. Yeah. So originally in that episode, you were like, I really want to get this fixed. If we can, I'd like to do a little thing on it, blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, just because it's so ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Well, I have a friend who actually used to be on Mark's show for a little while, Reed. Yep. And he was in town and he had, you know, we were talking about it again. Mm-hmm. And he's just like, I, I'd try it, you know. And yeah. I said, well, I'll tell you what, you can have it if you get it running mm-hmm. and then loan it back to me. Right. But then afterwards you can have it, right? So in mm-hmm. other words, it's a very huge undertaking because it basically is going to have to remake the lock work. Mm-hmm. And he's going to have to sleeve that barrel and a bunch of other stuff. Like the gun has to be remanufactured in order to be safe to use even with a replacement black powder cartridge, right? Right. So it is a it is a huge undertaking to make that gun work. It was. Does very, that mean you're technically paying him in the gun to then make it run, so well, that you could then shoot it and then send it back to him? Well, essentially, yes. It's one of those things where it's like technically I'm getting the better part of the deal because I get to shoot the thing and display it. It's super cool, and everybody will be into seeing it shoot finally. Right. But he's going to put in more effort than it's worth to buy even something as weird as that. Uh huh. And I had just gotten into it cheap because I bumped into it and it was a. It was giant and weird. Piece of nothing, yeah, right? you love big weird. So it was actually part of a two piece lot that I wanted the other thing in, and I just got stuck with it. Mm-hmm. So um, he sent me a message that he had taken some dimensions, and it was all of like last week. So it's weird that this came up again. Yeah, I know, right? Because it just came up again. Yeah. So um, if he does anything, great. And if he doesn't, it comes back to me because that was the thing. It was like either you fix it or it comes back to me. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how he does. Yeah. All right. The next one is from Tim. Do you have any plans to produce an episode in the future on the Trapdoor Springfield? Yes. He likes them in general. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd also like to cover, like, the Burdan 1 if I can. Oh, yeah, um, that'd be cool. They're very rare in the Russian sense, but people forget that Spain had them. Mm-hmm. Um, it was bad. I, what cartridge uh, was did that Did Spain one? have it in? I don't yeah, remember. that's a curious... I can't recall. Uh, there was some bidding in Europe, and I meant to bid on them, but I didn't know the auction site that well, and we were traveling a lot, and I just sort of decided We've had not to had mixed results them. with European yeah. auctions. But if anybody has, like, a, a Burdan one, I would like to cover that, too. But, uh, you know, other guns in that sort of vague family are, like, the Tursin mm-hmm. and the Albini. I'd like to cover them. Oh, that'd be good, yeah. So, excuse me, I keep hiccuping. But yeah, um, okay. those are the sort of things. Yeah, fair. So. And then another one, uh, we had a few of these where it was like, do you plan to cover this specific gun? Right. Uh, do you want, are you going to do an episode on the Winchester Lee Model 19 or 1895? I'm trying to remember that gun. The Lee Navy? Is that what we're thinking I about? I think so. I'm pretty sure that's what he's referring to, the Lee Navy, which oh, is 95. Brain. Hold on. I got to make sure because I don't want to mess this up. Right. I yeah. Mean, yeah, he must be in the Lee Navy of Street Pool. Um, we have a couple offers to borrow those, and there's one gentleman that's working on his own hand loads for it, last I heard anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, can't recall if the other guys told me that they had worked up appropriate hand loads or not. That's a gun with a very low margin of error right. uh, for shooting and a very high value. Mm-hmm. So I've been sort of holding off in the sense that I don't want to get blowed up real good. It's Yeah, it's one of those uh, do you shoot it or not kind of things, and it's like, we want to, but we're going to be extra, extra, extra cautious. Yeah. Also, you're probably I'm not registering quiet. on the mic. My bad. I yeah, am, you're I'm, gonna hate yourself in editing because you. It's okay. I got a little bit quieter because I got a little tired. I'll just here we go. Ready? Okay. Mm-hmm. Just, just yell. Anyway, um, we, yeah, we plan to cover <sighs> Don't it, but that fast. The problem we've been having is ugh, a lot of these specialty projects get overlapped, so we, there's no way we're gonna be able to. A Lee Navy, right? Anywhere near a black powder episode? No, because it's... both of them are the kind of thing that take extra time, and so we need something more normal in between. And we've sort of gotten 
we've gotten sort of caught on open ground with a lot of weird guns. Yes, we did. And it's not going away anytime soon. Like, I've got David working on yet another custom cartridge. <laughs> Poor David. Um, Sorry, then, David. Yeah. We love you. If we can get some open ground. My bad. It, it'll get covered, but what you'll probably see is us also covering some more basic stuff around it. Right. Um, which would be nice. And then another one, uh, are you coming doing an episode of Martini Henry, specifically the 577-450 version? Yes. Yeah. We're doing several episodes in the Martini Henrys. Mm -hmm. um, we're hoping to have a certain mustachioed gentleman come down and help with this. That would be fun. So. And then, let's see here. This is from Ibu Spark. Oh, I didn't say who those people were that asked those questions. Caden was the last one, I think. Okay. And then Ivy Sparky, someone already uh, kind of asked my question. In the well, then what are you doing, bud? I know, right? In the Repercussion series, are you planning to cover rifles? Like the Hall rifle, the Ferguson and the Burnside as examples. If there are reproductions, then yes, we will cover mm -hmm. them in the Repercussions. Sure. If we can get them. Um, and if the story is there for us to develop. Mm -hmm. if, if there not, are not reproductions... Then we might cover them, and they would be just regular primers. Yeah, because primer effectively is just whatever it is going. Uh, yeah, there's there's stuff they didn't guns. reproduce that we can just cover as a primer, but we have to get a hold of a gun in reasonable condition. Right. Uh, the big question now is, what would we do the Colt eighteen seventy three? Will we do it as an original because they're around? Ooh. Or we do it as a repercussion? I think that's an opportunity thing. Whatever. Or would we do it as a hybrid in which we have both and decide whether or not the reproductions are any good? That would be fun. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay. All right, this next one's from Rio. <laughs> yeah, just decide. Rio, um, given the legality of flamethrowers in most states, will we ever see the history of something like the Wex or Flammenwerfer? Fer? I'm sure I'm mispronouncing. Flammenwerfer M16. Whatever, M16. Or is that just not really in the cars to do the unobtainiumness of it? Two problems. <laughs> well, three problems. Me. Very rare and dangerous. And right. three, not a firearm. Um, the problem is that the minute I touch a flamethrower, everybody's going to be like, cover rifle grenades, cover mortars, cover tanks, cover, tanks, cover and it's just going to be like, guys, I, keep, I don't, I don't have, there's actually a lovely book out on the flamethrowers of World War One. Oh, really? Um, I can't quite remember the title, but I don't think there's a lot of flamethrowers of World War One books. Fair. So, I think Take it was under, <laughs> oh god, I'm trying to remember who Use your it. Google food. But, uh, yeah, I highly recommend it, but unfortunately, no, you're probably not going to see us do flamethrowers. Mm. Um, it's neat, and people get excited. But it's just not our wheelhouse. Right. So Fair. All right. This next one is from Kodal. Um, I think I'm saying that right. I think I've mispronounced it every time. Uh, what non-military sporting rifle or other firearm would you like to do a primer on? And then actually he asked several questions, but he said to pick his, pick one to answer. So I, uh, I'm just going with the top one, I guess. Oh my God. He really did. Put Two of these are, one of these is not like the other two. Oh, yeah, no. I'm going with the first one, bud. Yeah, you don't make He, he make did say, he, he wrote, he wrote in a, in a reply to his thing, he went, oh, crap, I just read the fact that you asked us to say one, one. question, so pick your, pick, pick whichever. And okay. so I just went with the top one. Uh, Non-military sporting rifle, we've kind of done that by accident. Mm -hmm. Um, But reasonably, I'm actually not opposed to doing some sporting rifles. We're going to see it with the shotguns, they're going to be oh, sporting. Oh, yeah. I mean, th that's um, going to be an entirely different series. But they're too. not going to be primer style. No. Most sporting stuff can't be done primer style. There's mm -hmm. not as much detail or resolution there. Uh, weirdly, um, I'm working slowly, slowly and patiently, patiently on some of the pocket uh, pocket revolvers. Right. Just to understand if the mechanisms contributed elsewhere. I was looking at them. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a commercial pocket revolver that I did not know had a military pedigree. Oh. And it will surprise everybody. Oh. So that's going to take a little I'm already while. startled. It, it might be next year before that's put together. Okay. But so three years from now. Because <laughs> right now in our world, next year has meant three years from now. There's just stuff I want to put together and understand. I've got, I'm asking some questions overseas. So like. So four years from now. <laughs> Just keeps increasing. <laughs> yeah, but um, there's a number of little stuff, but the problem is it's just I can't stretch it to primer length. There's very few. I know you guys will be like. So what is primer length then like in an, your mind? Uh, like an hour long documentary, right? Right. I mean, I guess, but Which, well, some of the earlier ones were like 30 minutes. Yeah, but once you've set this, the once you've established it, the depth just isn't there for some of the commercial guns. Yeah. Like there's just, there's not that much to say because there's not that much written down about mm -hmm. them. Which is why the shotgun series is not going to be these long episodes. It's going to be these very curated, like, visual episodes if we can ever get the... Actually, the grass has been growing. Knock yeah. on wood. I still think it's not going to be this There's year. There's wood under that. Da David thinks we'll have the, the grass, but I don't think we will. I think the grass won't quite make it by the end of the summer. Yeah, I think we should see what it's going to look like next uh, 
I think it's going to be next spring. spring. I think yeah. we'll be, this time next year, we'll have probably filmed about half the episodes. We can probably it. do some practice in some of the cooler months, too, so that'll work yeah, out. Yeah, in the fall, we mm -hmm. can do some... Yeah, visual practice I mean, and we stuff. Might, we might be able to film in the fall. I guess the... we should start gathering some extra pieces for that series we were talking about now, then. This spring, that way we have them in time for the fall to be Maybe. able to do some we'll prepping. See. There's just some last little bits we need to get. Okay. Uh, uh, this next one's from John. Actually, let's uh, take a pause with the cameras. Oh, okay. Matthias? Yeah, sorry, I was just thinking, if we're actually on number 16 of the cuts, which we probably missed one or two numbers, mm -hmm. but the cuts are a minimum of 15 minutes each. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. I already know. Okay. It's because of the very beginning. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, put the blame on me for answering questions well. You went on, like, so many tangents. I know, that's what we do. Oh, my God. Number 16, this is John. Given proper resources, budget, time, research, help, etc., are there any historical military subjects you would enjoy covering in the C and Arsenal style? So if we had the actual, if you had the actual time and the help, uh, you would need to cover it. What would be fantastical world ideal? Uh, 2A law. What? We kind of talked about this before, like the week, this week in guns thing I was talking about. Uh -huh. I constantly think about what it would be like if I took everything I had uh -huh. and put it to just documenting how the heck we got the gun laws we have. Mm -hmm. um, because I think people would be frankly surprised. Like the the amount of talk, it's it really it's this thing. So I entered the surplus market as a younger man. Mm -hmm. And I looked around and I went, here's what everybody's talking about. Here's what people are writing articles about. Mm -hmm. Here's where the books are. Mm -hmm. And then the truth is kind of down here pretty close to the books. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to get between the books and the truth. I get it. It's very hard. Having done this for so many years, mm -hmm. this is the you area. Just, you realize you just look a crab, though, right? Yes, I'm While a crab. you're doing all of this. I'm the angry crab of trapped knowledge. Yes. So <laughs> this part I'm okay with. Uh huh. But this the sort of the immediate mistakes that get made between books and articles. Yes. Or books and people talking about it on forums. Mm hmm. And then the surface level of people just sort of being like, that's a Garand, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, like, it, the conversation is so far away from the actual material. Mm -hmm. And when I look at 2A law and the things that people talk about, because it's rolled into political entertainment, mm -hmm. in which it's our side versus their side, it's bundled up with a bunch of other identity stuff. The law aspect of it has an argument and evolution. There's places where it went wrong. Um, from what it wanted to do, and there's places where it did do what it wanted to do, whether that was right or wrong, I don't care. I'm just talking about the mechanics of it. Mm -hmm. There's all this crisscross. And the way we talk about firearms law makes no goddamn sense. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it is just absolutely inverted. So do you think that you'd be able to talk about it in the scene arsenal style, which means remaining apolitical? <sighs> I think you could because there's some very basic stuff like um, people like to say class three mm -hmm. when they mean SOT. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then when they say SOT, they're not even thinking about the word tax. Mm -hmm. But that's what it is. Right. You know what I mean? And then yeah. and then what's a form one and a form? Like there's all this stuff that you interact with more and more now, especially because of what we've been trying to get into for getting the show done or, or just being close to other people that do this stuff for a living. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um but then there's also just other things like the NFA with people will ask me, is it okay that this is a stock pistol versus that? And the answer is usually like, there's only so many named exemptions. And then even that doesn't make a lot of sense. Or like the Tigerbear, which is like the no, the only over 50 cal that's allowed for some reason. Mm -hmm. For reasons. And so like, there's lots of actually fairly interesting nuggets in there. Right. But the problem is everybody sort of says, so the Tigerbear, everybody sort of says, yeah, there's a carve out for the Tigerbear. And my answer is like, who? Who owned one? Mm -hmm. Someone owned one mm -hmm. and said, hold on. Do we know? Is it some senator? Do we know his name? Mm -hmm. I don't have time to go dig, but boy, it'd be really fascinating to know that. Right. Like, who put a car out just for themselves and their pet Tiga Bear? Mm -hmm. That's actually fascinating. Yeah. And then, especially NFA stuff where it's like, you know, I've talked about this a lot with um, Matt, Matthew LaRosse here. Over at Fudbusters. The, the short barrel rifle and short barrel shotgun existed to plug a loophole because they were like, okay, we're going to ban handguns. And then somebody went, well, hold on. If we do that, they're just going to cut down rifles and shotguns. Okay, we're going to do that to plug that loophole, right? Mm -hmm. And then the 11th hour, they're like, okay, we're not going to ban handguns. Right. But they left the loophole plug, which right. is why it makes no sense in American law that you can have Sorry, like I... you can have a handgun that is perfectly concealable, but you can't have this awkwardly not very concealable Obrez BS, right? Right. And that's because, as far as I can tell, nobody went back in and pulled the loophole. Mm -hmm. 
but I haven't had time to really dig into it. It's right. just that seems to be what it is. So like you with your brain, you're just fascinated by the the trail that yeah. has been left behind. And you're like, I want to be able to investigate that my style. Right. I got kind of a taste of it when we were doing the Smith & Wesson thing where in World War One it was like, wait, so Smith & Wesson got seized? And I'm going through all these like period legal reviews and stuff. Yeah. And it's this whole constitutional dilemma as to whether they could do it or not. But they did. Mm -hmm. And they did it by having sort of like a shell company that was staffed by army personnel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is one heck of a curve. You know what I mean? Like that's right. some... I'm sorry, guys. The like That's founding fathers good. are rolling in their graves on that one because, like, hold on, we can't. But they did, and they still do it the same way. They do the, the whole all of our regulations to the tax system. It's very interesting. Yep. It's very wrong. Oh yeah. In that it's ass backwards and jury rigged. Mm -hmm. to, you know what I mean? Like they've completely like. I mean, it's the same thing as gerrymandering districts. You know uh -huh. what I mean? Where it's just like it's just a friggin' trick. Mm -hmm. But. But you would like to go back through and do it scene Arsenal style. You would enjoy right. that the most. You're very passionate about it, so it would be actually quite interesting to see you work and with I think, it. I think you can do it politically neutral because you, you could be the kind of person that says, well, I think the X or Y should be illegal. But you might not agree that the way you do it is by contorting yourself into this friggin' weird lying shape to do it. You should just come out and pass a law mm -hmm. and not... Or make an amendment and or something. And not try to just right. secret it in with holes. <laughs> so I'm not saying that it has to be inherently political, but I am saying it would be very interesting to be like, how the heck did we get here? Because we are built on top of so much trash that we don't even understand how unstable the pile is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that'd be interesting. That's my TED talk. <laughs> it was a good TED I saw the rug. All right. Um, this next one's from Jazz Swimley. I think. Jazz Swimley. Yaz Wimley. Maybe Yaz. Maybe the J is just a Y. Swimley. Just Swimley. Okay. Uh, if you were going to do a Project Lightning-esque series on weapons from another conflict, what conflict would you choose, What and what guns would you like to include? None of them. <laughs> At least this is better than when are you getting to World War II, because everybody assumed we were going to World War II. Right. But we're never doing another conflict-oriented... Yeah, that was a bit fixed much. List. If I, I would love to do it that way. In if, an ideal world, it'd be fun. If we had unlimited access to firearms, yes. I yes. would just do it by conflict. But because we don't, li having a fixed list had made this a nightmare scenario. Mm -hmm. Well, so. he's saying Project Lightning-esque. So he, I think he's thinking more just literally the style of Project Lightning where it was eight episodes. Oh, comparatively? Yeah. Um. So if you could pick any conflict in the guns, let's just say you already have no, that. No, by World War II, everything's too asymmetrical. Mm-hmm. So I don't know that I would really do it for World War II. I mean, autoloaders of World War II would be kind of fun, I guess, but not... Mm. And then I think a lot of that I could handle without having them in person. I think Project Lightning, the one good thing about it was being able to have these really weird, awful light all machine guns. All together at the same just time. Just so people could see how awful they were at the same time and watch the Lewis gun blow them all apart. I know. So, um... But the Matsum didn't do so bad. It just it was not still... It I know, it was still like 20 points below. Um... That was pretty funny. No, I don't think I'd do it from conflict. It would be interesting. I think it'd be fun. Uh, Bloke on the Range again, I think, was the one that started this. He started a comparison series of single-shot rifles. That has been interesting. With sort of like a mad minute for each yeah. one. Yeah. Um, and I know Rob and some others have joined in. Uh, I have some stuff they haven't covered. My only problem with that is the way they're doing it is very shooter-dependent and blah, 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 blah. Sure. So... Um, if I had the time and money and availability, it'd be fun to get sort of everybody together to rehash that. Because mm -hmm. I think it'd be really funny to get a bunch of gun, like historical gun tubers mm -hmm. and put them in one place and hand out a bunch of the old single shots. But the problem with that is you would have to have like over 100 rounds of com blame yeah. and over 100 <laughs> rounds of 43 Spanish. And these are David all guns that are cry. hard to get those volumes. I think he of, would just cry. Well, it's mostly just getting the price. It's not making them. That's difficult enough, but it's the just getting enough of that brass on right. hand. The 450 might be the easiest one to do that for. Um, but doing it for all of them would be really expensive. And as, time consuming. Right. Not just even expensive, just being able to find them. Right. And then you'd have to do it for like a week straight because you'd exhaust everybody because everybody would have to try the gun out. Right. So could you, you imagine like rest? trying to do that one minute run and then... Yeah, so, but it would be kind of, it would be really funny, though. Yeah, it would like, be really good. 
You'd have to kind of, you'd have to eliminate models. You couldn't do like all the rolling blocks. You'd pick a rolling block that's yeah, representative. Yeah, I feel like peeling, picking one would be fun. All of the trapdoors that, all the flip forward trapdoors. Yeah. You kind of have to pick what you think is the best one out of them and send it or as the you representative. Could pick the one that was like the most produced, like the mo the biggest well known one. That's true. That might be the better way to go about it. But it would just be one of those sort of system comparative things that would yeah. be really fun. And I think you'd get a lot of outtakes and I think you'd get a lot of laughs. Oh, yeah, I can yeah. imagine. So that'd be kind of fun. Yeah. All right, what's up next? Uh, tank Destroyer Sarge. Uh, yes. Tank Destroyer Sarge. Yeah. No, uh, this says Tank Destroyer Your Sarge. I think I misspelled that. Okay. <laughs> Not a question, but a suggestion for you guys. Oh, well, this is a Q&A. Yeah. Well, he does ask the question technically at the end. Break up the Q&A into a couple few episodes. It would stretch out the material, give you more filler, maybe release them quarterly. No. Yeah, unfortunately, we found that typically any sort of break from the Primer series ends up with a dip in uh, Primer support, or uh, yeah. patron support, specifically. Uh, so, around the time of our Portuguese Abadie episode, was our, I think at the time, our highest support level. Yeah, we had a weird, we massive spike. We have to do some math now, because some of you split over to Utreon like we wanted, which, by the way, uh, we hit our 10% of our funding through Utreon Woo! thing that we wanted. Ooh, thank you. Which is good, because... Uh, we are terrified that Patreon will just turn their eyes on us one day and just shut us out. For, like, no reason. Because and they've done that to others. I want to point out, multiple times people in my life have said, well, so-and-so does whatever, and he's never been in trouble. And then within a month, that guy's banned from something. Yeah. Uh, whatever platform, um, whatever There's situation. been several other uh, gun channels that have been just dropped for even and the problem is, is that even if they were to drop you for a reason that is later determined that is a false reason... They can't magically flip a switch and everything's back to normal. Right, you no, have to have everybody put no their money back in. website and, is like that. I'm going to yeah, tell you that now. Regathering everybody is a nightmare. Right. So being able to have at least a modicum somewhere else. That way we just don't suddenly right. die. And Neutron's a startup. So look, I love Ed. Ed, if you're watching, I love you very much. Oh, yeah. it, it's not like it's an established platform that will last forever. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be here for a couple of years trying to do its thing. Yeah. And so do I want every dollar over there? No. Do I want a fair bit of them? Yes, because I want that platform to have a chance of success. And, and growth and we're potential. We're very supportive of them, and mm -hmm. it's also giving me a backup so that I'm not stuck on... Because Subscribestar never hit the numbers necessary As to a, hold us together. Right. And Subscribestar never gave us an inkling I that mean, they would be reliable enough to. We can't just function on Nutrion, but the fact that we exist there as a platform, it gives us the basis for in case anything dro drops somewhere for Patreon right. or whatever, we could be literally like, hey... Go over here. We're here. We're here. So here's what happened. We have we have like X number of subscribers, and then we have a fraction of X Y number of patrons on across all the platforms. Mm -hmm. And then we have a fraction of Y mm -hmm. that actually show up and listen to like our internal podcasts and other things like that. Yeah, it's actually not a huge amount of people listen to the podcast. And we and stuff. tried doing more sort of notices on Patreon back yeah, in the day. we tried producing more content in general. Right. We would try doing little text ups on Patreon or something. We'd do something to be interesting on there. And every time we did, we lost money. Really weird. Yeah. So more content lost us money because it wasn't consistent. Well, more patron specific content. Yeah. Patron dedicated. Yeah, yeah. Content. More content on Patreon because it wasn't consistent. So now we have a consistent internal sort of shareholders podcast. Right. And we have the show every other week. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we do, have um, the Minute of Mace. We have monthly scans that we give out for patrons too for some of the higher dollar ones because they actually specifically right. seem to like and appreciate historical information and right. content um and it's more of a thank you because they already existed they're already higher level guys just to be nice to us right so we're like well we better do something nice back yeah so what we've done is we've actually tried to limit our engagement to stuff that's highly <laughs> we we try to limit our engagement to stuff that is within the expected vein yes so whenever we get outside of our expectations we lose money mm -hmm. harshly um and to be fair, as much as the show's been growing, you look at our numbers over the past year, and we've managed to punch up pretty good. Mm -hmm. We've lost money. Which is weird. Yes. YouTube, whenever we get, for whatever number of viewers we get extra, like, it's so bizarre. We have 100,000 more subscribers. We have at least 30% more viewers on average. And yet somehow we're still making the same monthly amount because the, whatever our, our rate per viewer is seems mm -hmm. to drop consistently with how many more viewers we get. So we get the same 
measly check every month because yeah. YouTube My favorite just is refuses if we, to pay us. If we accrue too many subscribers at once, YouTube has literally sent a message to us more than once on one occasion. I've got screenshots of them being like, hey, we've noticed that something's spiking your subscriber accounts. We think they're bots. And then all of a sudden, boo, 10,000 subscribers get deleted. And I've been personally even taken off our own CN Arsenal account as far as unsubscribe from the channel. I'm an admin on it. Right. I got unsubscribed. So anyway, the short, the short story is we're very sensitive to fluctuations in the, our funding. Our funding has consistently been dropping a little bit at a time, even though the channel is growing, uh, both through ads and through patronage. Patronage is down um, because we just haven't driven the sort of, like, I guess, new topic engagement that we want. Also, maybe we just haven't been reaching new people or whatever. Yeah. I'm not sure. But then whenever we kind of try to kick it, mm -hmm. people get angry. So introducing the clips, uh, those little shorts we were doing. Yes. Uh, negative 10 subscribers on average per clip. Which is really weird. So we abandoned them for a while, yeah. and we're going to try to bring them back later because that's what we may, the Minute the of May, May is originally did that. Negative subscribers for every Minute of May, and then next thing you know, next year they were working out. So right. we're just going to... We're, we're going to abandon the concept for now. We'll see what happens in a year or two if they suddenly get picked well, up by yeah, the we, algorithm. Yeah, we literally were losing money on the clips by making them. That was amazing. And so yeah. the, the same thing would go for the Q&As, unfortunately. I just don't feel like they fit within whatever this weird vein of expectation is. Mm -hmm. It's very self-serving, um, and I don't think it's a way to make money. And to be fair, it, we're not really big into the Q&As either personally. It's just we've found that it for some viewers that actually they enjoy the connection and the engagement, and plus for us, it gives us a slight break to reassess and make sure that we are on track and or gaining uh, right. track, essentially. We really do, by the way, we read the money as sort of the way to judge what we're doing. Not because we're greedy, but because at this point, we really do need to actually be growing still. Mm -hmm. We really probably need one more staff member to balance the load, because May and I still work well over 60 hours a week. Mm -hmm. So I drink, I'm not really I drink coffee. I'm not... <laughs> I'm not sure what our plan is at the moment because we're still like, we're not hemorrhaging or anything, but it's like, we're going to get older. We don't have retirement set up. Oh, yeah, we are going to get older. It's, we got to figure something out here. Mm -hmm. And so we just, we've been staying off of the Q&As. We've been sticking I, to what I've we just know. found ibuprofen helps. And then everybody says, well, if I just write a book and you're like, the books are harder to make than the episodes and this I'm still going to make More the episode. Time consuming. Anyway, so, to answer that question around, by the way. This has uh, been my rant, but uh, yeah. that's why we don't do that because... Yeah. You guys are very complicated, and you react in weird and amazing ways. Yeah. And also, I don't like to sit here and just sort of hold court. Um, I'd like to do a once a month live show. Yeah, but that's not really Q and A. No, but that'll be something different for give us, and also give us an opportunity to handle guns live for a little thing, which we can only really do over on YouTube right now. Yeah, that's right true. They give so. us back that ability. Um, uh, let's take pause. a pause for the cameras. All right. By the um, way, I'm sorry if that got mired down it's very complicated oh, like yeah. i actually get headaches trying to figure out why things work the way they do on the back end yeah it does I, seem a bit much i just want to i just want to read about guns and, and talk about them i know I and know then now do. i'm in charge of all this stuff. Okay. <laughs> hey is there james wants to know is there any chance of a collab with drac Fennell? <laughs> yeah Drac's there is because we already did it buddy Drac it's just, it hasn't this chair's hurt my butt um i've offered him a pillow more than once and he's refused i don't need a butt pillow uh, so, uh, yeah, there's a chance we already did it. It's mm -hmm. just, um, we haven't put it up yet. It's a lot of footage. I think we, uh, to the patrons, we leaked some images, or yes. an image. Oh, crap, I forgot to put that up. I did. Thank you. So, that's taken care of. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, that happened. We hung out. He was cool. Uh, yeah. We actually have a, we recorded a thing with him that's going to be releasing whenever we get the video set up. You need up. to confirm you're happy with it. That's true. May said the audio sounds good on it. Um, yeah, good enough. I'm passing it. The The plan is to give... The current plan is we filmed with him. The project's getting partially assembled by us, finally assembled by him and hosted on his channel. Uh -huh. And then he's going to, of course, mention us. And then we're going to make a big announcement about it and tell people that there's an audio interview with him uh, for our patrons. Mm -hmm. Because we're the larger channel, so hopefully he'll get subscribers. And then we're more patron-focused in so our goals, we'll so patrons. hopefully we get more patrons. Yeah. That's the that's the goal. We'll see how it works out. Yeah. Uh, this next one is from Jacob. Will you guys be doing a collab with Indy for World War II like you did with the Great War? No. No. Um, we were invited to that project, and I have been personally blamed for the failures of the collaboration aspect of it. Well, you and several others were personally blamed. I think not just you. No, I was, I was named. Oh, okay. Because uh, we were actually, they billed us on a lot of their advertising for it that we were involved in the World War II project, and... Uh, 
I was the last person. We were the only currently standing partner. I was the last person to be asked about it. Mm -hmm. So after Ian, I found out by Ian announcing that he was a part of it. I wasn't asked before that. Even though we'd already done the collab and stuff. Right. So as the internal partner, I was told last. And then for good reason, because I knew the insanity. So um, I then came in and said, look, there's some copyright issues and things that we're going to have uh, going video, into World War sources. II. Also, we're really not in a position to turn our ship that fast. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of telling us this as you're fundraising for it in the middle of a fundraiser. This is really weird. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got called a negative Nancy. I refused to officially join the project until some conditions were met. They were never met. Um, the internal update process never happened. And next thing you know, you're launching and nobody knows what's going on. And they started announcing that we were participating with them when we hadn't agreed to it. Right. Yet. And then to be frank, they did not understand. They didn't understand what it would take to do that collaborative element. They didn't put in the effort that they would and need. And there was a lot of fingers that they were trying to shove in the pie at once. And a lot of the fingers didn't know even what was going on at all. They would have had to hire like three full-time employees to just handle the organization of the collaboration part. Right. And I tried saying that at the beginning, and everybody got mad at me for being Negative Nancy in the middle of a fundraiser, which is what it was about. You say Negative Nancy. I'm guessing you really did get called a Negative Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> There's like, I have an email from Carl that I'm keeping forever. Okay. In which, like, the conversation had been turned, like, this because it's this big email chain. And I can't, I don't want to put everybody's stuff on blast. But, I know. Uh, there's this big email chain, and it's clear that it's being, like, pointed at Othias is just poisoning the well. Because Othias is the only one ballsy enough to be like, guys, you're really not helping, and nobody knows what they're doing. Uh -huh. And I was, like, me trying to steer from behind. Uh -huh. Being like, guys, the way to fix this is over here. Please, God, just fix it or abandon it, you uh -huh. know? And, um... I got kind of like passive aggressively chewed out in an email. Uh, it's like Carl had one of the best like email responses where it was basically like, he's like, yeah, I was all in until Matthias said something. And he just ruined everything. Like he was just like, <laughs> he was like, I mean, totally just trying. It was, it was absolutely ironically to, and, and nobody could read it wrong at all. Like he was just like, yeah, piece of shit. Matthias really ruined this. And like, cause he had just picked up on the, the, the attempted blame game. And it's still one of the funniest things he ever done. Like, I was just like, <laughs> Uh, oh, I was great. laughing so hard. Like I like I love Carl so much for that email. It was I great. Know. But it was um good. Yeah, it, it was just honestly it was too much for them to do. And so I I'm not going to contort myself for that. Yeah, it's we contorted ourselves the first time for them and we had mixed results with that too. Yeah, it's true. So it's just it's too hard for us to do. It, it is a lot of overhead to try to get stuff in place at mm -hmm. the right time. Yep, I so. agree. Uh this next one is from I'm going to call you R for sure. Okay, go ahead and read the thing. <laughs> Jonathan Ferguson mentioned you in a recent in a video recently. Do you think cross promotion from other content creators could help see an arsenal in a meaningful way? I mean, yes, yes we do. Duh. It has helped in the past in general. Well, we kind of we're, we're, it's almost. A lot of you aren't old enough to remember web rings. Nope. Yeah. But before Google was really a big thing, and especially before there was any sort of like content discovery system, mm -hmm. you would have web rings. So oh. you would sign up to be in this ring Is of this websites. Like Sonic the Hedgehog rings and but and the web? No, you would sign up to be part of a ring of websites loosely associated around a topic. Mm -hmm. And then when you somebody read your page, they could then go to the next site on the web ring because that would keep you sort of so if you were like a UFO topic thing, right, you would get the other UFO websites together and be like, look, just let's all join up on this web ring so that we refer to each other so that people can find us because oh. the search engines were that bad, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> or if it was like cookies, you know, you'd be a part of the cookie bakery web ring, right? Okay. And it was this manual reference system. Sure. Um, <laughs> and every site. I remember back in the, people remember back in the days, every site would have a links page. Okay. Just a page of links. Oh. Just so that you would be able to discover stuff. And, and it was the this links sort of, page, okay, And it sure. was this community thing where it's just like, well, it's I like got to put a links page. Forum. Well, you know, you, you don't, the person who didn't have a links page didn't get any links because mm -hmm. it's like, no, 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 you got to keep driving traffic in a circle somewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. um, you can't be the end destination. <sighs> That's rude. Right. I mean, yeah. And so the problem is the way the YouTube algorithm has gone for us, mm -hmm. where we don't get shown to anybody unless they're specifically watching Forgotten Weapons. Mm -hmm. And then maybe. Right. You know, like, it's like we did the partnership with Draken FNL. 
And we're curious. To I don't see think how you that get will... recommended seeing Arsenal when you watch Drac, but why wouldn't you? There's a lot of crossover and interest there. Right. So I'll be curious to see how it works out with the videos he'll be putting up on his channel. Yeah, essentially by the collaboration system, you're basically reforming the old web ring network. It's just a way for people to at least know you frigging exist. Right. So yeah, no, it's a good idea. Yeah, I agree. Um Let's see here. Another question from Leslie. Uh, out of the gun tubers you have interacted with, uh, which one was the best slash great, the, I'm sorry, greatest to work with, and why ain't it Kevin? It's not Kevin. No, it's not Kevin. Kevin is really friggin' difficult to get to come over mm -hmm. for two. Even though we hang out and we're friends. Oh, I offer him money. I offer him hugs. I gave I him, offer him mango treats, and mango treats are his favorite. Kevin is the worst mofo for getting to I just made, take two days off and get over here. I made rice <sighs> and ground beef because he was eating a ton of rice and ground beef and back his, then. And I had just it like, in my well, the family doesn't know what to I do. I specifically when I leave. bought cranberry juice every time he came to visit. And you know he didn't drink the cranberry juice. Do you know who had to drink it? Not me. Who drank it? I think Susie drank it. And then one time she didn't drink any of it, and then I just secretly took it to Doc's, and it disappeared, and I was okay with that. That's also good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it ain't Kevin. <laughs> Ass. <laughs> Actually, yeah. no, um, Kevin's actually very difficult to work. He's fun to film with, but good Lord, buddy, just come over. Come hang He's out. He's not even that far I away. Like hanging out with you. But did you not like our friendship, Kevin? Oh Do you hate our friendship, Kevin? Oh, my God. Am I not your friend? I don't know if I'm Kevin's friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, gun no. tubers. We haven't actually, you know, the funny is we've interacted with a lot of gun tubers. Yeah, that's true. But uh, research wise, we mostly interact with like Jonathan Ferguson. True. And like Blip on the Range. Mm hmm. And I occasionally chitter chatter with like Carl and Ian. Yeah. Carl and I mostly gossip. That's true. You're mostly it's, gossip. It's infrequent communication. Like, I don't talk to him very often, but it's... Although, on rare occasion, we talk about some black powder stuff. That's true. And then there's some other guys that, you know, one or two Z conversations, right? Mm -hmm. um, like Chad from IB88. Yeah, I don't talk to him as much as I used to. Well, I didn't. Yeah, I, used I, to I never really got to talk as much either, but yeah. Um, in terms of actually working, working with someone, though, outside of... Because, you know, Bloke's great for helping me do research. Same oh, with Jonathan. Yeah. Like, they're both super helpful guys, but it's usually off-camera stuff. If you're talking about, like, physical direct interaction, though. Well, I think, I think this is probably more about who's it best to work with when you're actually making a video. Yes. And the problem um, is we haven't made videos with that many people if you really rack them up. That's true. So our pool size is very small, but out of the ones that we have worked with, I'd say Ian, hands yeah. down. Uh, I had a great time with IV88. I don't want to be insulting or anything. Oh, no, But yeah. I was also there sharing stage time with Mark. It was a one-time thing, and it was a limited run thing. Like, you yeah. just went out and filmed and then hung out. We somewhere. only had a few things, so, like, honestly, that was an easy film day for everyone, I want right. to say. Well, no, it was hot, and people were working hard, but for us, we considered no, it, it easy. It wasn't hot. And <laughs> for us, we were, we were just like, you yeah, know, I think I had so. a little bit of perspira perspiration, but it was nothing like here. No, but, um... There's chicken sandwiches, we had, too. For the Project Lightning, we had a ton of moving pieces. It was over-ambitious. We, we worked it to the ground. Yep. May and I did not... Actually, we got a lot of shit. And that's, in that series, it's always just like, you know, May and I were, like, slightly behind Ian day one, because we had no we had very little sleep the night before day one and then basically day two i'm just like boo and then you're day just two, kind of slowly going down day two and we don't present it that way we don't tell what day everything's happening on so it's like no. the first event we're doing okay yeah and then we start like really falling off and towards the end it's just like these two slobs can't keep up with you at all right and what nobody notices is it's like the first event you and i were running on light sleep uh-huh and he had slept yeah and then the next day ian gets i think like six hours sleep because he was up pretty late too uh-huh but he gets like six seven hours sleep and you and I get, you get like three and I get two. Yep. And then the third day, I didn't sleep that night. I fell asleep on the Lewis gun. And then May had like two hours of sleep again. So I think you had four hours of sleep. I, he legitimately was ha had me posing and laying down with the gun so that he could what, get the right angle. And I legitimately <laughs> fell asleep on the Lewis gun. So cursed Ian, we would take him back to his hotel, dump him off, and he'd get about six hours maybe. That lucky bastard. Which... It doesn't sound like a lot, but when, it's I mean, literally, because so nice what we didn't think about, what we didn't factor in was how long it took to unload our cards. Yeah, to so, check the footage, because effectively, if something had screwed up so bad, there was the chance to refilm was the next day. Yeah, we had to check all the Ian footage. So especially. we actually had the whole day. The best part was we thought we were so cool and so smart because we had the whole day planned out down to the hour, even for eating, for showering. It was perfect. It was and so then smart. we got home and day one. We went unloading the cards. Idiots. We totally forgot. Unloading and verifying footage and audio is insanely time consuming. 
for yeah. all the footage we took. It was bad. So we actually had, I think we had like, we had a whole shoot I segment. I still remember that. There was a whole shoot segment oh. we canceled. I can't remember which one it was. It's like my Vietnam flashback. I'm just like, oh. But May and I were just like, and poor Ian's just like, did you guys sleep? And it's like, no. He's no. just like, how are you doing? You know what I mean? Like he was just like, he was concerned. But that's why you notice May and I fall apart real fast because, like, yeah, that's what happens. When, that's how well we can compete with Ian when we don't have sleep, apparently. So, um, which still wasn't good. <laughs> I'm still not happy. No, but about we that. didn't have it's not like World War II where you can take meth and just deal with it. I should have oh, gotten some crap, meth. meth. Yeah. Oh, that's where we screwed so, up. Not the um, sleep, not the lack of sleep, it was the lack of meth. meth. That's the problem. <laughs> Can we get some of that now? Yeah. Can we get some of that for tonight? Because it's already 2 a.m. We, we already look like, like we've been scratching ourselves because the sunburns. Oh, so yeah. We, already look like we both were out in the sun. Of course, I at least suntanned, but I'm still. To be fair, I didn't burn um, except for like it's under the hat. You forgot to spray your face because you weren't wearing a, a hat. Yeah, we were out all day. Uh -huh. And uh, I actually don't burn very easily. That's true. Um, your hand is a little red. It's a little. Nah, but that's just, that's fine. Okay. It's not burn. I don't feel anything. Um, Go ahead. No, I don't want to hurt. Okay, you. it's not gonna. Anyway, I've already hurt your thumb out, because you punched me that track, one time and you hurt your. Thumb. And I said suntan, and I, I saw how long we we're gonna be out, <laughs> and that the, there are no clouds in the sky. And I was like, I better put on suntan lotion, even though I normally don't have to. Uh huh. So I spray myself all down, and I'm all proud of myself. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't put on a hat the whole time we were out nope. there. He usually wears a hat. That was really weird. Right. I just well, I forgot to throw one in the car, so I didn't have one. So I was like, okay. Meanwhile, I, just, I had. Five hats in the car. But since somebody always has his hat when he's out in the sun, uh -huh. somebody didn't think about the fact that he had to spray his face. So yeah. I ended up getting it on the cheeks well, had, and the forehead. He also had uh, sunglasses on, so it really didn't appear that bright to you in general. No, but that wouldn't matter. I mean, I should know. I knew to put on suntan lotion. I mm -hmm. even reapplied at one point. <laughs> But I didn't put any on my face because <laughs> the hat normally his takes hands care and stuff. He's like, yeah, I have I'm all good this job. and I have the anyway. <laughs> so um, no, but Ian was great mm -hmm. on filming with. Yeah. Because he's a machine. Yeah, he's like us. He was. He wanted to get the footage, so he was. We were get, We were not done until we got the footage, yeah, and then we would, were done. He would stay up as late as it needed to be for the footage. The only reason he got sleep realistically is because he couldn't do anything to make it the cards upload faster. Yeah, but if it had, if it was a task he, that he could have helped us with, he wouldn't have gotten sleep either. I think Ian would have stayed awake for three days straight. Absolutely, I don't doubt that. He's so task oriented. After just watching like we him being that far willing to go with us for the distance, I was like, no, nah, I wouldn't have second guessed him helping us at all. Sure, I was talking to him about something, and he was talking about working with someone. I don't want to out anybody, but this was sure. a while ago. Oh, I love gossip. Yeah, but we got. A, um, we got a nice compliment because I was talking to him. I was like, "Yeah, how's it going?" Blah blah. He's like, "Yeah, I'm over." Blah, 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 blah. And so I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, is it working out with you?" And he just sort of stopped and he's just like, "I like working with you best." <laughs> so he got the compliment because it was his very polite way of being like they're being uh, slow and precious. May and I have noticed other people tend to stop what they're doing in order to uh, eat and sleep and uh, poop. That's for the week. And you uh, hold your poop. I, I have known May to have like stomach distress. Uh, well, and in the, in the you gotta get stuff done. Oh, on a film day when everything's stacked up, I've literally seen May take a shovel into the woods yes. and just be like, mm -mm, we're finishing this in 20 minutes or less. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I'm prepared. I've I, even told my colon, you've gotta be ready. And it knows. <laughs> it knows not to mess with me because I will destroy it. I feel bad. I'm like fat and pushing 40. Yeah. And the Zoomers will hang out with us uh -huh. to do something. And it's like three or four hours in and they're just like, how does he still go? Like he's old and fat and he's just still going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, get up. We're going to put him. It's true. <laughs> it gonna... actually is true. I mean, the next day you're destroyed. But oh, like... yeah. But, uh, that's tomorrow. Yeah. Me's got it now. <laughs> Me today's got to get this shit done. Me tomorrow. <laughs> Kim. Oh, damn it. I got it. 1620. Just did or, it. Nope. 16 0 and take uh, 17. Okay. What are you? These are all numbers. Take I Take 17. <laughs> nope. 17. Seven. It's in 16 0 0. Just do that. 0 0. F, F for me. Okay. <sighs> I hate me later. That's okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, let's uh, take a break for the cameras because we need okay. that. Move your foot. It is now 2.30 in the morning. Yep. I don't think we're going to stop. I think we're just going to do this. Let's go. How many, how many All right. I've got another Red Bull in the fridge. Five pages. I've got another Red Bull in the fridge. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> I just found it. I can bounce in the seat. Okay. okay. All right. This one's from Jeff. Ow. <laughs> Your tailbone hurts. Oh my god, it hurts exactly. There's a pillow up there. I'm literally I, staring at a I butt feel pillow. Like I have a butt I, feel like, I feel like I have one of those vestigial tails, but it's made out of pain. <laughs> I can't do this. Okay. 
Okay. I'm sorry for your tail. Your pain tail. Um, mm -hmm. This one's from John. When the shotgun series kicks off, can we get Clifton Hicks on another podcast? Yeah. We would like to get more than that. Yeah, I can. I mean, I can ask him on again some other time. I love yeah. Clifton. Yeah, he's a nice guy. I really haven't. I need to meet up with him. But I, know, I feel like you two would just enjoy hanging out. Yeah, I really wanted to do the music for the shotgun series, though. That'd be I great. know. I think it'd be great. I love yeah. him. I like his old. I like his preservation of an old art. You know. Mm hmm. And uh, it was you know an oral history that he's trying to digitize, which is really cool. Oh yeah. Anybody. So uh, Clifton Hicks is a banjo historian mm -hmm. that we had on, and. Um, yeah, he's another one that's it's another history that sort of walks um, almost dangerous political lines mm -hmm. because it has associations with sort of racial relationships and stuff, and so it's it's a it's a hard topic sometimes. Yeah, but it's super fascinating. It's a beautiful instrument, and it's a very American instrument that was shared by all Americans. So yep. super interesting to look into. Oh yeah. But also, really friendly guy, always willing to, you know, answer questions and chat. Yeah, I love him. Yeah. So check out Clifton Hicks. Definitely. All right, next question. Alan. That's Alan. a paragraph. Wait, tell the story about the cat. What? This guy's name's Alan. I don't have that story. That's you. You and Susie have that story. Yeah, but you were there. Vaguely. I don't really remember. Oh, oh right. right. Alan. Oh, yeah. yeah Alan, okay. Right. When we were living in downtown oh, Charleston. God. Yeah, this was a thing. 200-year-old colonial building that we were renting the top floor of. Mm -hmm. um, you, we're on the top floor, and the buildings are designed with transoms and good airflow. Right. So if you rig the building right, you could save a lot of money mm -hmm. when you're poor. And mm -hmm. we did. Yeah. You could rig the building right, especially on the second floor, where you could get a beautiful tunnel of breeze through the whole so building. So you just pop all the windows and the and transoms, and it was wonderful some of those summer nights. I, I still miss that, that if I'm yeah. honest. Like, I don't like leaving my windows open while I'm sleeping on the ground floor. Mm -mm. But on the second floor, actually, I'm pretty cool with it. Yeah, that was and pretty nice. we only have a one-story house now. I would just set up a box so. fan in the window, and then I was good. Oh, on, like, low, just a little bit of pull. Yeah, that yeah. was nice. But the problem with that is that we're leaving my window open. Mm-hmm. Uh, or any of our windows because we could all hear it. Yeah, it would just um, echo through the house. <laughs> Alan. There's this woman that lived behind us for several years. Alan. Who at like 2 in the morning would come out <laughs> just, and, on weekdays yeah. and just go, Alan. Alan. Mm -hmm. And not like, not or any of the other no, sounds no, no, that no. you would make it when you're just, calling this, an animal. This gentle yet vocal, Alan. Alan. No, no, but you're, you raised right, on the right. second one. No, it, it was almost like yeah, somebody right. had a voice recorder and they were playing the exact same iteration every time. Right. It was inhuman. Uh-huh. And that's what, whenever we see the name Alan, we think of that lady. Yeah. Who and would so call like, out to uh, Alan the cat. Sue's got mad one night and she's like, I don't know if it's your boyfriend or your cat, but it's not coming when you call. Put it on a leash. <laughs> She did get mad. It was really late. She was tired. She had work the next morning. She got woken up because of Alan again. Yelling. It wakes you up more than screaming. Oh, yeah. Because it's Alan. Or, well, it's a female voice. Alan. It's just delicate yet loud and just enough to wake you up. Yeah. Okay. So, what's up? Anyway, Alan. Not you, Alan. cat Alan. <laughs> um, this have, is from Alan. Mm -hmm. Have you considered doing special episodes about things that ha you have touched on at individual primers? Okay. But have never been able to cover in full. So, like, biographies of people or a certain, uh, like, things like the Siege of Plevna or whatever. All right, so, uh, you hear my, like, biography of Ferdinand Monlicker. If somebody writes one, I would love to talk about parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, realistically, doing them in an episode is never quite as effective as just reading the book. Like, the most recent Kornstein biography of Browning is really cool. Right. If, you, if, you're gun hit, if you're into the gun hit, I, every person who watches this show with any regularity should have bought Gorenstein's book by now. Mm -hmm. It is a very, very good story yep. about the most famous arms designer that nobody got the story right on. Mm -hmm. And it's, I can't, you know, we can't know this. I guarantee it's not 100% true because that's not how it works when you report things 100 years later. Right. But it's the most true story of Browning that's ever been, mm -hmm. as far as I can tell. Just, oh, yeah. Just by reading it, it is it's much more thought out. It is much more cohesive than anything I've seen before. Mm -hmm. I love it. It's inexpensive. It's on Amazon. Go get it. Yeah. So um, but yeah, that's the problem with the biography would... aspect. Yeah. I would, I've considered if we had... It's a lot of time. If anyone out there is a fun 2D animator, and I mean like Monty Python-esque, mm -hmm. contact me. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a biography series idea. 
but there's no time to do it that way. Right. But I would probably be able to find the funds specific to that. It would probably make enough funds to pay for itself. Mm-hmm. Um, I would risk some funding if somebody is a talented uh, visual 2D animator. Yeah, animator. And, they, and I, I want to say, like, you need to be able to get me enough drawing. How much time would can, they need if you to can be do able a, to? If you can do a caricature and you can do some basic, basic 2D animation in a Monty Python style, I think we could do something beautiful. So let me know. But other than that, I can't really do much so, with that. So, do you want to make a cake with Othias because he's willing to bake? Um, as far as like histories of certain companies, the problem is they get spread out mm-hmm. over many, many books. If you really want to get it right, right, and you end up they and their fortunes get spun around on people who don't get written about a lot. Mm-hmm. So the the company decisions come down to presidents and vice presidents and things like that. That even in the cult story, I had a hard time pinning down exactly who was doing what at what time. Mm -hmm. And even and there's sort of like secondary reference. I think for a lot of these company histories, the way I'd want to do them, I would need to get into some primary source material that I don't have access to, especially don't have the time to process. Right. Somebody needs to write those. I'm really dependent on somebody having written the book and me being able to summarize from that and then hopefully promote the book. Um, which we try to do, by the way, for authors. Oh, yeah, definitely. At the, the in of- the ep- every single episode in the description, there's a list of books in which we use from our reference for that episode. Now, there's also specific things like The Siege of Plevin, which we've seen in over the course of our show being talked about one way by the Russians, another way by the French, another way by the Ottomans. So effectively, but, you could do right. the versions from whoever. Sort of. Um, there's actually a gentleman that contacted me about this because he was really interested in it. And he had read... Uh, various accounts in sort of British and French and Russian history. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the Russians were writing in French at the time, so that, you know, don't forget that factor. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was curious about the Ottoman because he had heard I had the Ottoman perspective too. Because right. the commander at Plevin wrote a book. Mm-hmm. So I got him access to that because I knew where to find it online. And then he sat down and uh, translated from it. I think I might have helped him OCR it. I can't remember now. Mm -hmm. But he got it translated while he was stuck in Greece or something like that. Right. Um, But he hasn't compiled all his notes. So there is someone working on the Plevin issue. Cool. That's good to know. There's there's actually a gentleman right now, as far as I know it, that's trying to piece together the sort of the truth of the doctrine of Plevin and how people really thought about it. Um, Because there's a number of things that come out of that fight. And the interesting thing for our perspective on that one is... What actually happened had an effect on some people, but also what they thought happened had an effect because the repeating the magazine rifle became sort of a bigger push after mm-hmm. that, even though it looks like currently the magazine repeaters had almost nothing to do with the victory. But the Russians blamed magazine rifles, or at least somebody did, mm-hmm. because it became this rumor, or not rumor, but it became commonly reported that magazine rifles had an effect, and then everybody went to go look at magazine rifles. Hmm. So... Even if it wasn't true, that's what changed the, you know, the actual event. Sure. Sort of like uh, natural selection versus sexual selection. It's it's what you think is working versus what's actually working. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. All right. So let's see here. Next question. Uh, this one is from Pizza. What is Pizza. what is it that drives you to strive for the best presentation and information for these firearm documentaries? Autism. Literally that. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. The the desire to. It's, it's a curse on. because good luck picking an automobile with this kind of mindset where you're like, okay, but this has this feature and that has that. Uh-huh. Like, no, it's just, it's garbage D&D min-maxing behavior where mm-hmm. it's just like, but well, what about this? And also, I just, I really am unhappy with the explanations for things like... Um, when you first started looking into was, the information, yeah. What was that guy that had those YouTube videos where he's like, you can tell it's a uh, tree, be- or you can tell it's an aspen because of the way that it is. I think I know what you're talking about. Um, uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche Walks. Yes. That was a, go check out, it was an old joke video called Nietzsche Walks. Uh-huh. So nature, but spelled like the word neat. Uh-huh. I think it was Nietzsche Walks. That's yeah. pretty neat. That was his whole thing. <laughs> that's pretty neat. <laughs> he's like, that's pretty neat. <laughs> but he's walking around He nature. walked up to some tree and he's like, you can tell it's an aspen because of the way that it is. That's pretty and, neat. And it's like, the problem is there's so much material where I read it and that's how it comes off to me. Where I'm just like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, like, what do you mean? <laughs> so the problem is I just, I'm... T- I'm too evidence based, and so that's why I have the passion to be like, okay, what the hell is this guy talking about? And then, pretty much for me, uh, all the other things that I was doing, it, uh, I need to be busy. I like doing a lot of, I like spinning a lot of plates in the air. Turns out, 
I actually really enjoy doing that a Amazing lot. Amazing multitasking. Uh, so it's a lot of fun for me because I get to spend all the plates all the time and there's always too much to do and blah, blah, blah. And I, I actually enjoy that kind of May gets uh, depressed with uh, too much free time. It's actually, yeah, true. I don't do well with a lot of free time. We I tried, have to figure out projects. I remember trying to get her to take like three days off one time and she about had a panic attack. Yeah, I couldn't do that. It's just not for me. I got to do some stuff around the house or something yeah. at least. You were in like every sport in high school, right? Well, I was in like multiple sports. I also was a part of multiple clubs, started a few as well. Um, but just turns out I enjoy keeping busy and I enjoy having a lot of hobbies. Yeah. Hmm. All right, what else? Uh, this one is from Christian. Yes. Why Christian. did you struggle? Well, because I know a lot of Chris stands. So I was like, what is that? I'm, we I have just, a Chris want, 10 and a Chris 10. Right. I just want to take the eye out of there automatically. But it's from Christian. Do you have any plans or ideas for a Great War Small Arms retrospective or review special after you finish with them and move on to other Small Arms? Uh, no, because we we already kind of finished with them, but then yeah. we... Unless we did the, we, we did unless the top we, 10 of the Great War. In, of the so, bolt actions. Yeah. Essentially. Well, the rifles. Yeah. Um, we could well, do a pistols. We could probably do it for revolvers now? When we clear the 1911, we can do it for pistols overall. Yes. Um, Even though we won't have all of them, obviously we'll be still missing some. As we get through categories, we can do it. So if you think about it, Project Lightning was just about all the light machine guns. We, mm -hmm. we missed out on the Bergman, but we've never had access to one. All right. Um, so Project Lightning retrospectives those. Um... But we could do a pistol one, which I'm sure we will. We could do a revolver one, which I think should be separate from the pistol set. Yes, I agree. Um, we've done the rifle one. Mm -hmm. And then that's kind of about it. There's not like you can do really a submachine gun one. You know no, what I mean? not really. One, it's not two enough. Yeah. So um, we've kind of done that. Yeah. I'd really like to do a book or a pair of books. I, I really would like to do like... With, your, with our images too and the... A bunch of other stuff I don't I think it'd be out. fun to do like a big book of the handguns, a big book of the rifles, a big book of the machine guns. Yeah. I think that'd be great. Again, I would need a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Even after finding a lot of pieces we haven't had access to for photography, because for me, I would like to get the whole story. It's kind of and like a back burner project, essentially, right now. Yeah, there's a number of guns in that list that just do not. I've never. I don't know where they exist at all so in any museum. Okay. So, um, I've heard rumors of some of them existing existing in like Eastern European museums, but I don't know which ones, and I haven't mm -hmm. been able to go find out. Fair. So. All right. Next question. Milsurp Mike asks: uh, When doing research, is it worth to get for? Is it worth it to get foreign language sources for those of us who don't have a Susie handy? Yeah, there's well, um, yeah. there's a software you can buy. And actually, I think there's a there's actually a number of apps that do this now too. Mm -hmm. That do OCR and direct translation. Yep. But we have an old license for I believe ABBYY or ABBY. I can't it's remember like if Abby. it's Abby or ABBY. I think it's ABBYY. I might be wrong. I don't know. But anyway. Um, and we've been using that. You can Google up OCR translation yeah. software. It's out there. And then for actual translation from the scans, I mean, uh, DeepL is pretty good. And we've also been using Google Translate. So. Yeah. You can get... Don't go. Yes. There's some languages is that it Is it more time with. intensive? Yes. But if you want to know... You know, the, the, being written in a foreign language is almost no excuse nowadays. Right. Because you could just, it, granted it takes a little time, but you can sit there and process that into a readable, yeah. you know. It, it's especially slow with going, what, but doable. With what we're doing, it's not like, okay, I get it. It's not going to be like, you want to get Huck Finn into Bulgarian. Mm -hmm. So you just direct translate Huck Finn to Bulgarian. That's going to be garbage because there's, you're going to be missing all sorts of context. Nuance and stuff. Yeah. 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 But these are names and dates and places and mechanisms. And it might the take you a little bit to. The worst thing you're going to do is like the name of something they may call. Like, like in French, they call the hammer the cock. Or a rooster or things like right. that. Yeah. Which you could probably figure out. Yeah, pretty well. So. All right. Uh, this next one is from Albini. Can you walk us through the process Bruno uses to model and animate the guns you feature? What software does he use and capturing details, etc.? Uh, I feel like we need Bruno for this. Uh, I feel like we would need Bruno for this. I mean, I know he uses Maya software. Does he use Maya? Yeah. Um, because, sure? yeah, that's what he was using. And that's also something that I've worked with a little bit in oh, as okay. well. with. Not with him, but also seen it. Okay. Um, I didn't think it was. I thought it was something else. That's to my knowledge. That was the one he's been using for the last few years. Um, even no, when he, he first started. He mostly takes everything apart and photographs the individual pieces from multiple angles and then starts constructing them. And then he just has to timeline them into moving the way they're supposed to move. Mm -hmm. And then he picks his camera and lighting angles. Yep. And then he gets me a... Um, 
playblast of the mechanism as a whole, which I use to help me write a script. Just like a simple playblast of like maybe like the uh, just a quick function of the like gun. a single pass of the operation of the gun, mm -hmm. like just a, a loop. And then I use that to write a script in which I call out what we want to highlight and when. And yep. nowadays May reads the script and Bruno executes the script and with highlights yeah. of that nature. That's about it. Yeah. It's um it's pretty actually support. knock on wood, it's going pretty well. Now it's not something that you'd be able to say like if you were to buy one of his CADs, you couldn't just then print it or anything like that. No, it's not uh, the scale. People like ask for that. that. And it's, it's just not like, that perfect. Yeah, but people are surprised. Like they're like, but he already did that, so that's all the dimensions. And you're like, he snugs those in because yes. there's parallax errors from the camera, or there's just animation errors. And he errors tells where, you that stuff too when you go right. to because um, you can you can buy from him essentially uh, old stuff that he's worked with. No, but to my knowledge, no 3D scanning is involved because mm -hmm. that would be a lot. Yeah. Um, the, honestly, cleaning up 3D scans is fairly difficult to some degree. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. All right. Uh, when will another installment of It's a Trap and or Repercussion be made uh, to make an appearance? Well, Repercussion is literally next episode. Yeah, that's um, actually about to come up. It's a Trap is stuck. Uh, we got to get Kevin over here. Yep. And... He refuses to come. <sighs> it's hard to entice. It's going to get made with or without Kevin, though, because we've we've received some lovely devices that we would like we to We have, cover. and we are going to show them. So with or without you... We will get these done. Okay, and then you want to read the next one? Yeah. Uh, Chris, update on the Black Powder series. More Black Powder, please. Well, that's we just episode. said that. Yeah, so okay. that's coming. And then I think we probably need to Yeah, take we need to pause break. for the camera break. Uh, DK Hemseth. Sure, I think I said that right. Uh, given the status. What DKH Hemseth? Well, then that's just wrong. He didn't capitalize the E. Okay. Uh, given the status updates on your unloaded podcast, is the plan for video live streams on the back burner while you're working on primer, trap, shotgun, repercussion, etc.? Okay, so primer is in progress. It's, yep. Traps is stuck waiting on Kevin to get back to us and have some dang time. Mm hmm. Uh, Shotguns is on hold. Just until the grass grows, literally. Like, we want to make sure it's solid in there because we aren't going to start the, strat gun, the shotgun series and then all of a sudden the grass dies and doesn't that actually take. We're going to give it time to hold. Right. Um, or if it floods out and we're screwed. Mm -hmm. um, so, we also, shotguns is all going to get filmed and then processed, and then that way an entire season of it is done before you see the first episode. It. Yeah. So, shotguns is weird. Um, <clears throat> repercussion, we are literally... Repercussion is the same as Primer to, from our perspective. It just takes a little longer to do one. Mm -hmm. So one's coming next week. And then uh, the live stream, really the problem is I just, I haven't hit on the formula. But you know, now that we've been, uh, we've paused the clips, it's given you a little more time. So hopefully we'll be able to sit down here soon. Um, I've got, so because of this Q&A, mm -hmm. I actually blocked out two days for me to sit down and really think about what a live stream would look like. Mm -hmm. Because I know it's the next way to engage the audience. Um, I'm having the same feelings about the live stream that I did when I had feelings about doing video instead of writing articles. Yeah. I know it's going to be the next thing. I know it's going to take some time to evolve into something we want, but I do want to start off with a strong vision so that people don't get confused. And what I really don't want to do is turn into anything resembling like a Twitch stream, anything resembling like a just a, a here's, I'm the big man of Thias and everybody pay attention to me. Uh, the yeah, because I could see you <clears throat> doing that. I just don't want to be the one man band. I don't want it to be low value, high output, bland entertainment. Right. I want it to have some uh, value. So, those of you that have given us the crayon drawings so far, thank you. We already have four of them in the bank, and those will not go to waste. Yes, yeah, okay, so I like that idea because it seems silly, right? It's mm -hmm. like I'm going to have grown men send me crayon drawings of their uh, experiences shooting or, right. you know, something that they love about their gun or something like that. Mm -hmm. But as, And those were patrons, right? Yeah, that, yeah. That's humorous, mm -hmm. right? That it's a crayon drawing. It's uh -huh. cute. But in reading it, we will actually get to carry the voice of somebody that's right. from our audience and we'll get to reaffirm sort of what we love about what we're doing mm -hmm. and it actually has some value mm -hmm. and it's funny and yeah. cute right so i'm thinking of stuff like that to kind of structure the show around so it's not just me staring at the thing being like, uh boogers because <laughs> that's exactly what he does yeah well yeah. it's that or you have to go hot button political bullshit and uh -huh. it's just not 
everybody's so dog tired of it. You know what I mean? There's lots of guys out there that would disagree with me politically or agree with me politically. Right. And it doesn't matter either way because you know what I want at the end of the day? You know what I've been doing a lot lately? Mm. I've been listening to old radio shows. I have been enjoying the old radio shows. I've been listening to a ton of... If I had time... I would be doing, like, Othias' weekly old radio show That'd review. That'd be so much fun. But there's no time. Because yeah, I have okay. to listen to the whole episode, then audio bounce the whole... By the way, no one who does these old radio shows does any old... Uh, does, does any actual audio balancing, and I want to strangle them. Mm-hmm. Like, they want patrons and stuff, and it's like, learn to audio software. I could do a better job myself while we're doing this. Right. But, like, unless there's somebody I don't know about, send me an email, but... Um, all the ones I get are like, ah, brr, brr. yeah. The music suddenly just, Wah! and then all of a sudden the people are whispering and they're whispering. Right, but um, it's like the difference between thirty and ten. Anyway, the point being is TV. though, I am struggling to find things to listen to mm-hmm. that are not hot. But like I, I've talked to a lot of people, just trying to watch TV now. Oh, yeah. it's all highly political, mm-hmm. and I can't really watch anything because I'm working so much. All I can really get away with is listening to things. Same here, but. All podcasts are political. I used to try listening to, when we first got on the Patreon, mm-hmm. uh, people would see the, I had signed up for a number of fictional podcasts and it was public that I had. And so people had signed up to listen to some of them and they all went woke. And I don't really care that they went woke or Republican, although it seems like fiction always goes to the left. Mm-hmm. But the point being is I didn't want politics at all. It was very forced. Right. You know what I mean? It, it was like just, didn't go with the flow. I and remember. And then... On the, even the ones that the even if politics or identity didn't wander into the actual show itself, mm-hmm. the creators just started mouthing off about it right all the time through the Patreons, through the whatever, and I had it to just hear about distracting. it. Distracting, yeah, and it was just like, and suddenly everybody's this or that, and suddenly this is the devil and blah. And I went, this infection is. I'm not giving a dollar to anyone, mm-hmm. anyone. That is taking a non-political topic and making it political. I will burn it down to Mm -hmm. avoid consuming it. Right. Because that is propaganda. Like, it's garbage. Like, if it's not political and you're making it political, get away from me. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to do a history series. I understand guns are a hot-button topic for a lot of people. Yeah. I don't care. I'm not making it political because it's not supposed to be political. The only time you'll know about anything quote-unquote political is if it impacts our actual work is if a law is passed, that will impact what we're doing. Yes. Which, um, vaguely, I had a conversation on Discord about something like that, but that's a separate topic. Fair. All right. So, uh, on to the next question. We deviated a little bit there. Yeah. Uh, Samuel is asking, uh, what is the timeline for you to produce an episode? So uh, people who listen to the podcast and stuff like that, they get a behind the scenes perspective on, you know, all the ongoing dated or uh, week biweekly stuff that tends to be yeah, happening. It's a real today. deja vu on this. Why? You think the exact question was asked before? Why? It's just really deja vu Maybe he asks or someone asked the question almost identical to that before. Getting the episode, getting the well, the truth is it takes two weeks. Yeah, it we does release take about one every two other week, and it takes about the full two weeks. That's I mean, why it's really convenient whenever the research material overlaps, like between episodes, because then that means that effectively you get to try to produce two episodes within that time frame, and we get to about maybe two and a half, three weeks for each episode, then or for the total two episodes, which well, if works we're out. really trucking, if we if we wanted to work forty hours a week, mm-hmm. you and me both, yeah. It would take about five weeks to make two episodes. Yes. So we do them in pairs. Well, no, maybe about like four and four a half. Weeks, maybe four and a half. Four and a half. Yeah. Just a little bit over what it would do. So I think if we worked like 45, 50 hours a week, we could reliably get it done. Because there's also like some episodes are easier than others. But effectively, we're trying to build in like potential time to go do more difficult things like repercussion series. Well, no, no, that assumes not taking a day off on a Sunday. Well, right. But also on top of that, we're trying to build up things where like, you can go check out a gun show or someone gets sick invariably. You've right. got to be able to plan for, you know, backup days. So the problem is that means we end up working about 60 hours a week to get everything done inside Early. of three and some change. Yeah. So we really don't quite pull a week ahead for every double episode. And then we really don't pull a week ahead for every double episode, every two episodes, because 
we also then have you know a Sunday off or we go somewhere for two days or something. Stuff, yeah. Because there's things like, oh, you have to go do a bunch of errands today because we need to get this money order out, go visit David for ammunition, go test this thing here, right. go go make sure uh, things are working out for the animation for Bruno. Like there's a bunch of like extra stuff that's behind the scenes that I mean, you if you um I, I our think, old behind the scenes video out there is so outdated now I like, think compared to what with, it used to be. With easy episodes so nothing super extraneously hard. Mm -hmm. 60 hours a week. We could probably do, we'd probably pull about two days ahead for every pair of episodes. Mm -hmm. Two or three days ahead. Yeah, that'd be pretty good. That never works though. So we always end up either being just in time and therefore barely pulling ahead by a day every other episode essentially. Mm -hmm. or well, a day or two, yeah. May and I end up working like 80 hours and then crunching hard to get a week up, but then we end up using that week for some special project to hopefully get ahead or to meet somebody. And this is assuming everything works and everything's perfect. There's also accounting for things like, we went to the range, oh no, uh, the gun had a malfunction or, or, the, or the ammo didn't quite work out or whatever else. So some, this started raining on us and we had to stop filming. You know, that's always happened. Yeah. And then that means that you got lost time that you didn't account for or you were including as your buffer time. So there's always stuff like that that you can't account for. Okay. What else? Uh, Gerald is asking, uh, is the repercussion series more or less difficult to produce? We kind of answer that, but yeah, read we... the next one. Huh? He, he has more questions on it. Oh, um, and how far back do you plan on going? Let's do that one. Okay. Um, as far back as we can for reproductions, essentially. Well, I'm not opposed. Already, you've already gone on that far back. You already did the Patterson, but you're working your way up from the Patterson. So that was as far back as you were going for the repercussions, quote unquote. I don't think that I want to go to Matchlock necessarily, unless I'm just talking about conceptually. Mm -hmm. Well, you say that, but Tanegashima are pretty standardized. Those are, yeah. But I think the, the trick is I would like to cover guns that are standardized in some way. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to go back to just hand guns because they're not standardized. It's just this sort of like, would I do a special on them? Sure. Mm -hmm. But would I want to do like an episode on this handgun versus that handgun? No. Yeah. I don't really want to do a bunch of different match locks mm -hmm. unless there's some radically different features in them because right. it's just, mm. yeah. Um, so just the further back, the more bespoke it becomes and the more it sort of falls apart doing it as a repeatable martial arm with sure. a pattern to it. Yeah. All right. Um, Josie. You, yeah. Let's go with that. Uh, will we see what? any- It's Josie. Yeah. Like Josie and the Pussycats. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. You're probably sick of that. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That's... Uh, will we see any more content from your Caltech Sub 2000 or has that thing <laughs> run its course? Uh, I have less than 500 rounds of that gun and it broke. Yeah. Uh, the, well, the marketing guy did reach out to you. and No, 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 no. I reached out to him. Um, oh. <clears throat> the Caltex Sub 2000, uh, this is another one of those things where it gets too complicated because of reasons. Uh -huh. That thing has so few original parts in it. Mm -hmm. And it broke the, the one of the locking lugs cracked, which mm -hmm. is super not good, uh -huh. um, at a very low round count. The problem is the mating surface that's in contact with that is an aluminum replacement release. It's mm -hmm. where it hits the release on the trigger guard. Yeah. And so I don't know if it's Caltech's fault or the company that makes that aluminum trigger guard's fault, but apparently Caltech works closely with them according to their head of marketing, so they would want to know either way. Mm -hmm. um, that was two years ago. So <clears throat> um, I contacted the marketing guy. He got back to me. I then ran into him at IV88 personally, talked mm -hmm. to him. The problem is they were supposed to, I, I was trying to make an arrangement where I could just send them my gun mm -hmm. because what I was really scared of is I'd send them the customized gun with all the stuff in it and then they'd just go, okay, it broke and they would just send me a new kel -Tec. And then you'd I'd have lost all, all my all stuff. stuff. Yeah. The alternative to that is to strip my gun, put all the factory kel stuff that's in a box somewhere in here, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Which is hours and hours and hours of effort mm -hmm. and then just a huge pain in my butt. Right. And then have them RMA that. Or I could have just bought another Caltech for, what, 500 bucks? But then now they're kind of hard to find, I guess. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, it became this thing where it's like, I sent him a message like, hey, can I just send you this gun? And if there's a problem with it that you can't swap that part, could you just send me the gun back? back yeah. Or maybe send it with another so I can transpose those parts immediately and send you back the broken stuff or something. You know, right. Is there some way I can work this out to make this a little more efficient for me? He's like, yeah, no problem. And then later on, I'm like, hey, what are we doing? He's just like, well, you should have gotten a thing. 
to to set, like it should have been like a, a confirmation number was sent to you for like pre shipping or something. And like wow. nothing oh, showed. Oh, email or something. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, nothing showed up, and then I didn't hear from him again. And I ran into him and reminded him, and then we didn't get back in. And I just, if I emailed him and stayed on him every other day, it would get done. But I keep forgetting to, mm-hmm. and it just became a low priority. So one of these days, after I can't get a replacement model, <laughs> yeah, I'll remember to get this go. done. Yeah. So yeah, it's sitting there. I'm I'm kind of sad I miss it, but it's just sitting there being broken at the moment. That's fair. Um, everybody email Caltech and tell them no, don't. <laughs> this one's from Travis. Um, can we get another video on the Caltech Foldy Boy? I mean, you can about it being broke. Yeah. Actually, that might get it done faster. <laughs> Actually, Mike. <laughs> you know, I'll send him an email. If I can't get it done within a week, I'll just make the video about my Caltech broke it under 500 rounds and then watch it and be like, oh. <laughs> um, this next one is from Canadian. While filming, we always or almost always uh, see a demonstration of the safety in action. Has a safety ever failed during a cut take and a round accidentally discharged or has it ever just not worked properly? Uh, we inspect the guns before we shoot them. We do. So Thoroughly. they have always worked. Which is nice. Because there's only one that didn't work, mm-hmm. which was, we had to fix it, which was the Campo Guido. Yes, that's right. It had right. walked out, it had worn out because it was an interference safety. And again, we found this out prior to ever shooting it. Right. So the Campo Guido was, well, it was repaired long enough to do that, and I bet it wouldn't work now. Because it's not a great safety, and no, the frame was kind of cracked there. So uh, there's that one. And then the other one with the broken safety was the Nambu 1902 Type A modifier. Right, I forgot about that. But it was the other that. way around, which is that they couldn't keep shooting the gun. Right. I had to release the trigger. Like, I had to release it entirely. You had to release the grip safety yeah, and, then and pull it back in. Yeah, and re-grip it. So that was so really like, weird. Boom, flap, flap. Boom, flap, flap. 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 It was boom. really weird. We actually have another one on loan at the moment um, so that we could refilm for a minute of May because I was like, we really should just get... Yeah, we next time we Next time we go to film some pistols... We're going to take it out. I've got a little ammo. We're going to shoot one that doesn't do that. Yeah, that'd be nice. And then use it for the minute of May footage. That'd be great. I like to shoot one that I could actually just shoot without waving every time. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think that's like the worst of it in terms of those. Yeah. And then the next one is kind of similar. Uh, what were some of the scariest moments of filming with you didn't say the name. Furbish? Oh, this one's from Veteran of Mushroom Wars. Veteran of the Mushroom Wars. Of the Mushroom Wars, I'm sorry. What were some of the scariest moments of filming with older slash refurbished firearms? Well, the Veterally. Yeah, the Veterally blew up. Yeah, literally blew up. Were you in there? I forget, were you in the room for that? I was not. Yeah, I think Because I would have been pissed and murdered people. (laughs) Who? Who would you murder? Me? No, you you already had uh, wood on your face. No, the Veterally was annoying because it was like... We didn't think it needed a string fire because it had been the other one. The other one had been fine that we'd previously tried. Right. But we didn't know that one was developing a lug crack apparently. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we tend to put a um, heavy. So it goes into the string test followed by. Uh, I highly recommend this putting some sort of heavy blanket or material over the action mm-hmm. because just because it tries the spring test doesn't mean it's not going to vent hot gas. Right. So that one had already been blanket rolled. So it had fired two rounds without, without incident. any sort of extreme. And you pull this light you, using a light colored blanket is great because you can see the gas. Mm-hmm. So I pulled it off and there's a little bit of gas dust, which was expected for the way that that gun was uh, done. But it was like the tiniest bit of blow by on the case mouth, right. so which it, we've seen before. So you basically like, okay, this could be. So all it's right. like little tiny particulate, and you're like, eh, it's fine. Like this, I've seen on other guns that are much better built. Mm-hmm. So um, it's like okay, so let's just see where it's hitting. So I was when it I was the first round mm-hmm. of unblanketed, and like okay, I want to see if it's hitting high or low. If we're keyholing. That kind of thing. And then basically we're out. This is why you always wear your eye protection. Yeah, I was. Always wear the eye protection. So um, I I had no hat on and we're in an indoor range. And it was just like, and it just vented in the, like, case uh, case separation Mm -hmm. vented into the, uh, not separation, but case blowout. Right. um, At the little unsupported edge at the rear. Mm -hmm. uh, Vented into the magazine well. And then bulge that, mm-hmm. which is crazy to think about because that's an open bottom mag. Right. Imagine if it was closed bottom. I know, right? So that would have like, probably popped apart. It would have grenaded way more. Mm-hmm. So it vented straight down, blew wide, and then uh, that that caused um, 
really what it was is the the magazine well and the inside you know, in the, the magazine the woods. magazine body sort of going but because the receiver suffered no damage mm -hmm. but the magazine body just blocked and buckled mm -hmm. and when it did that it blew the wood and the wood especially on those guns has an insert around the magazine right so that just went Bop, and just ruptured straight up mm -hmm. and down and then it just boom, embedded wood shards all in my face yep and so um you know, even with due diligence, we didn't see the worst part is I went and checked those casings and the, because I guess the other casings were thicker based because they're reloads, mm -hmm. um, the thicker based casings didn't really show any signs of fatigue. Mm -hmm. and I, I mean, a little bit of crazing because it was like a rough chamber. Right. But, but nothing like, extreme. No. Um, I just, I'm still confused by that gun in some ways, mm -hmm. but I just don't between that and the other one. Cracking up. I was just like, yeah, I'm, I'm done with these better release. I don't want to know why they work the way they do. Right. People still argue with me about them. I don't know. Like, but it blew out. Like, the ammo ran fine and everything else. Mm -hmm. It ultimately ran fine in the combination of the two guns. Yep. That, so whatever one probably had stress on it. But yeah. yeah. We'll need to take a break for the camera. So give oh, us yeah. a sec. Oh, that's why. But yeah, so that was, uh, that was the scariest, one of the scariest moments, I would say. The top scariest. Yeah, it was really annoying. Yeah. Uh, I will say we had a friend of ours lose vision in one eye yep. due to an out of battery nine millimeter casing that just poofed in him, and the fragments that lost him his vision in his eye were probably no worse than the fragments that were coming at my face because he had actually less damage to, around his face, mm -hmm. and I had these things embedded in my forehead, so always glasses because that's the one thing is he he literally had. He thought he was done he for the day. He had it on all Oh, no, day. He, wear, the he wears them, but he thought he was done for the day, and he set them down, and then blah, 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 and he found three loose rounds of 9 millimeter. and went, oh, I'll shoot those, and just forgot to put them back on, and in three friggin' rounds, managed to damage his eye permanently. And so it's just, it's really awful, but it's, you know, I, I feel bad. Yeah, me too. Anyway. Uh, this next one's from Mustafa's Fleas. Have you and Jonathan and or Jonathan Ferguson had any luck recovering the efforts of the UPS British Customs Lost World War One Galilean sites that we have talked about? Uh, okay, so this is podcast stuff. Yes. Um, Jonathan Ferguson did a video on the Galilean site and cited us. Yes. Because, um, okay, now we got to tell this story. We're almost done, though. We're towards the end, right? Uh, uh, four pages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's only 3 a.m. Those are more personal questions, so those will go a little bit easier on us. Uh, here's the short run. Auction in Britain, I had been setting money aside because of our everybody wanting us to do a sniper episode for a while. Mm -hmm. So I basically been socking away a few hundred bucks a month for months and months and months and months and months, waiting for essentially Galilean sites. Because mm -hmm. we so, knew borrowing them was going to be impossible. Uh, so I stole from that and a little active money in order to bid on these things to an extreme degree, sadly. Mm -hmm. But we can always resell them when we're done. So, Presumably. And everybody would like us to cover if this. If we got them. So, uh... We spend thousands of dollars yeah. on a set of little sites. Mm -hmm. We send them over to the Royal Armories because the auctioneer, this is also my fun part. Yeah. I've read all through the terms of service auctioneer and it's basically like sometimes we ship, sometimes we don't. And it's all by the item. And then I'm looking at the item and there's no saying whether or not it's shipping as far as I can tell or I missed it buried in some footnote mm -hmm. and i'm going oh it's two pieces of glass they'll have to ship it right? right so then i pay I, I bid on it i win the auction the next day i get the uh, invoice for it and when i check online the invoice says yada yada thousands of dollars no shipping and i'm like why wasn't the bright red no shipping available right. before this uh -huh. so it's the, i talked to them and it's just like well i was if you guys can't do it i'll try to get a courier over to you but would you be willing to ship it somewhere fairly close by in Britain because I have a friend that's willing to receive them. It's like, no, we don't really do that. And I was like, okay, so I'll tell my friend, Jonathan Ferguson of the Royal Armories, that he doesn't, that, that he needs to come over there himself. Is that mm -hmm. what we're doing? And they're just like, oh, okay, well, 16 pounds. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, they're like, oh, it's going to the Royal Armories. Yeah. So um, thanks, Jonathan. You're my get out of jail free in the UK. Yeah. Part. So um, <laughs> send it over to him. And he's like, these are cool. And I was like, go ahead and do a video. Yeah, why not? I even told him he could shoot them as long as the problem is, I think I scared him because he's just like, can we shoot these? And I was just like, yeah, you can shoot those. The only thing is you have them in hand. I don't. Wait, did you tell him to shoot them or were you just like, just play with them? I don't remember if you said. No, no, I said you can go ahead and play with them. He said, do you think we can shoot these? And I said, I don't see why not, but you have them in hand. Mm -hmm. You can kind of flick them and, and check the housings. Mm -hmm. You tell me if you think they're safe to shoot with. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because he would, he would be in a position to judge whether they're kind of like 
rough in there or tight in there, if the mm-hmm. lenses are thick or thin or I've never held them. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So I just told him, I was like, it's your best judgment. If you think they won't break, go ahead and shoot them. Imagine the first time we, if we ever get our hands on testing them, we will need to make sure there's a literally soft blanket underneath. <laughs> well, no, because in case they fall, I actually plan on. So the thing about these Galilean sites is nobody knows that much about them. Mm-hmm. They, they think they do, but nobody has been able to tell me their exact magnification even. Mm-hmm. So I actually have a buddy with family in the lens industry, and I'm going to get a measurement on those lenses. That'd be good to see. Because I want to know the actual, I want to know the lens properties, and then we know the distance because it's fixed on the gun. I want to know about these lenses, right? Sure. So but, uh, as before far as we the, ever shoot them, I'm going to know the lenses. Right. So uh, as far as the recovery efforts go, so uh, at that point, after Jonathan was done with them, he you know patched them up very nicely and yeah. sent them on those way to us. Oh, no, it gets better than that because he's like, hey, i got this all set up. What am I putting in for the sh- insurance money? Right, and you told him And the, I was like, uh, we better go over just to be sure because so, like, replacing them. So you tell him a like crazy like, number. Yes, yeah, so I dropped it. Saying it like more than I've ever spent on a car number. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Although I don't have very expensive cars. That's true. Um, and he goes, what? And I was like, yeah, because he already handled them and everything. Right, and you're just like, well, and I'm just trying to make sure. I was blah, just, blah, he's blah. like, I was like, well, here's the auction, and he went, oh my god, like I just, he's like, the problem is that I only know like this one guy that owns these things. Yeah. And he probably now that I think about it, he's like 80, so he probably bought them. I mean, he didn't say the age, but yeah. he's an older guy. And he's like, he probably bought them, you know, in a yard he, sale yeah, or something long back time when nobody ago, gave a crap. Long time right. ago. So he's just like, I don't know what I thought this should cost, but I guess yeah. Now that I think about it, holy shit. Uh-huh. So. <laughs> So he's like, okay, Customs is going to love you. Uh-huh. And so he sends them in the mail, and they promptly disappear. Yeah. Um, and then it's also very hard to get your money back on those insurance. I know people are like, we've said it insured. It's like, talk to people who've tried to get that insurance money, especially right. when it's a high dollar amount. Mm-hmm. They, they get effed. So um, the most expensive thing I think I've ever bought in my life outside of a house disappears into... United Kingdom Customs, right. basically. And their thing is, apparently, they sent him a very generic email before he even got back to the office from shipping it. Yeah, same day. That said, uh, you didn't turn in the form. And he did. He had actually turned in a form manually to the person. Uh-huh. And then he had put one in the box in the with the item. Mm-hmm. And then on the outside of the box, he had put a plastic window that said... The form is in here. Like in this he plastic knew. window as well, on the outside of the package, yeah. tear here if needed. Yeah, it's like customs form here if needed, right? Mm-hmm. And then they went, well, yeah, I have the form. And they did it the minute he had dropped it off, yeah. which means that they did it before he gave them the form. They probably didn't have the form at the moment they sent that notice because he hadn't handed it physically to the woman. Or, or the woman or whoever yeah. just kind of went, Boop, I don't know what that yeah. is. So, but the problem is they didn't say that in the email. The email just said, there's an update to your package. And he's looking at that going, well, yeah, I just, del- I just dropped it off for delivery. He assumed that was that. So yeah, that's of the course. update, right? And you did too, because you got the, you got the same notification. tells us it's delivering right? a week later-ish. Mm-hmm. So when that... And then actually, it does go from that UPS drop-off place to the customs and leads. So it actually did move. Right. So we assumed, okay, well, it's moving. Then it freezes there, which, by the way, is completely normal for us. You mm-hmm. see things go to customs, freeze there. And, and then nothing gets updated. On, yeah. And it shows up at your door. Yeah. It happens all the time. So we think nothing of it. It doesn't show up the day of. And we're like, well, we better investigate. So we try calling. They want Jonathan to call. Jonathan calls. And then he goes, they said they didn't have the form. <laughs> and I was like, what? He's like, I gave them three copies of it. He's mad. So yeah. he starts sending scathing emails. They don't care. So uh, then it's just like, well, that's bad. Yeah. And so, so the last update, however. Well, no, no, no. It, you forget. So he resends the forum, sends in all these scathing emails, and, you know, it goes. Then they're like, okay, we had the forums. Oh, wait, now it's lost. So then they take several days to try to find it. What are you looking for? Water. Keep okay. going. So they take several days to try to find it, and they finally do find it, and they're like, okay, we have the package and we have the papers. We're going to continue sending it. So they send it on and process it from there. It passes through customs. And then uh, from there, it finally made it to the United States a few days ago. And I saw it. It was like, oh, good. It's scanned into Philadelphia. Great. We're going to see it in a few days from there. It goes to Philadelphia customs. That? And then it sits there for a day. I watch it. I've been updating myself. I've been refreshing it every morning and every evening just to kind of, I'm paranoid. And then I see it makes it to their customs and it sits there. And then it sits there. The date suddenly changes from an estimated date to the date where we provide it as soon as possible. And I know. So I called them this morning and they're just like, oh, 
it turns out that there's a customs like amount due yeah, and you got to pay that, but that department doesn't open until Monday. Can I pay it online? Let me spend 40 minutes of wasting your time to basically tell you, no. I don't know how to do my job. And also <laughs> I'm not really certain. I need your account number. Uh, okay, well, I signed up for an account, and it doesn't have a number. I can give you my username. I can give you other stuff. But account, but account number shouldn't automatically assign you to a package. It should be that when you set up the package, you should be having an account to set up the package. They need Jonathan's account number. Anyway, Jonathan doesn't have an account number. He, he Never mind. Anyway, besides that, effectively, I have to wait and call on Monday to try to pay this customs import tax that, you know, hopefully now the package hasn't gotten lost. What are you doing? I'm checking to see that my thing's still on. Yeah, it's still on. I get worried they'll time out on they stuff this not long. Not for this long. Anyway, besides the point, it it's it's it is here in the United States, but now it's sitting waiting for us to pay custom import taxes on on Monday, presumably, assuming so, they also haven't lost it now. Uh, I really do love one of our guys on the um, patronage. On I think it was on Patreon itself. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody said that we should get it, next time we do anything like this, we should get a spot tracker thing, like a GPS tracker, mm -hmm. which you can actually buy the unit and then pay a uh, subscription. And yeah, oh yeah, the next We're time anything that. high dollar comes from overseas, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna like express mail this tracking thing mm -hmm. and just be like, just throw this in the box for me too. Yeah. And then that way I can be like, there it is. Cause mm -hmm. that would have been nice to just oh, be like, it's physically here. I know it's here. It so, like, yeah. All right. So that's the update on that one. So thank you for that recommendation. I can't remember who it was, but yeah, great I job. was like, this is genius. Please read this name. Um, squaw Dog girlfriend whatever, VO 52, 52. whatever 52. Are annual Q&A questions one per supporter or one per supporter per platform? Uh, one it's per one supporter. per supporter. I went through and I made sure, and there were some people who did reply twice, so sorry about that. I only wait, 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 they replied twice to the There was the one thread? person who replied twice. There was several they, people who said, had several questions under one reply. And we only took but did one anybody? Question. Did you check to see if anybody with the same username replied on two platforms? I would have noticed, yes. Hmm. So if you had different usernames, you could get away with whatever you want. Well, yeah, that I wouldn't have any control over. Yeah. I could only check by the usernames, so <laughs> you could have got me there. You got me. All right. So anyway. now um, we're getting into the personal-ish questions, yeah, I guess. Right? They're they're meant for us to be able to handle when we are up at three a.m. and we started at eight thirty. Okay. Well, then you start reading that while I stretch my buns. Okay. okay. This one's from Ryland. Uh, okay. After your successful campaign to get British Muzzle Loaders the most dapper influencer award at the Gundies, can we expect to see any changes in your wardrobe going forward? Um, nope. What changes would it be? Tucking my shirt in, being less fat. Uh, having a larger mustache, perchance? No, you guys get mad when I get it longer. It's true. It's because he hides his lip and it's Sometimes weird. Sometimes I do this and it upsets no, everybody. No, I don't look, like it. Look at my little his lip. His upper lip is um, um, like delicate um, um, looking. It's um, like um, looking at a baby on a um, face. Um, 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 He's like, you know the skin is that soft. <laughs> it's weird. I don't like that. Ah, buns. Okay. <laughs> right. And then he asked some serious questions, but guess what? You only get one, sucker. <laughs> ah, your face like, I was literally just taking the first question of this stuff, yeah. honestly. All right, um, this one's from Chairman. In a previous Q&A, he asked the question, who had the facial hair crown? Ian, Othias, or Rob? Rob was declared the winner. Now that Rob has been crowned most dapper and you have seen that stash in person, how magnificent was it? Kissably soft. I don't want to know why you know that. Y'all ever have Velcro Does he, I wonder on if, your Did you ask him lip? if he uses any sort of product or anything? No, I didn't ask him if he uses any product I mean, or I don't anything. know. Some dudes get that conversation. I mean, I said it tasted like coconut, but we didn't go further than that. Okay. Assuming that's from the mojitos. Um, let's see here. This is from AMD Blue. Can Bruno's nickname be Bootylicious after the 2001 single by Destiny's Child? Yeah, okay. Sure. Bruno I mean, seems pretty bootylicious to me. Yeah. I think he'd accept that name. I've... Bruno. He's pretty cash. Pretty delicious? Yeah. Okay. Is, it, is that we'll for you? We'll find out. Yeah. He'll put it in the comments, I'm sure. Is he actually watching this? I don't know, but remind me. Okay. And we'll tell him that. Will you tell him uh, when you do this in Ask here? Bruno. Ask Bruno. Booty delicious. Okay. Okay. And then he'll put it in the comments. I'll okay, have him comment. Sure. Okay. Uh, Tom. This one's from Tom. Would you consider a firearm-related book review series in the future? Uh, Ian, Which you've talked about. Books Ian's in got a lockdown, though. What do you mean? He does a firearms book review. 
Oh, book review. Yeah, that's true. He does tend to do that. Although, can he do that for um, all books, or is he now restricted to his company? What? No, no. He re- he just did a book review of some other I book last week. Know. He does it for his patrons. Oh, okay. Um, I would go that route because the problem is I tend to be in and out of the books for certain things. Mm-hmm. And I don't have the time to sit and read the whole book. Also, I don't know. Some of the books, would, would you really be able to give them any sort of positive review? <sighs> Because a lot of them you're mostly, I just mostly Some of the best person. ones are so difficult to read that I just yell. I know. I just got the Merwin Holbert. I just Hurl. hear him shouting. I just spent an insane amount of money on a Merwin Holbert book. Not insane, but for what it is, it's insane. Like over $100 uh-huh. on this Merwin Holbert book. Mm-hmm. And it is not good. I'm sorry. So I don't know if, as far as I know, it's supposed to be the best one. And it is not good. Um, I'm sorry. That really does suck. Yep. <laughs> I just, I. I want to do a review on it just so I could just be like, you've written a run-on sentence that you've stretched into a loose paragraph, <laughs> and half of it is redundant to the original part. You just said the same thing twice in one sentence. Uh-huh. With many words. Uh-huh. Anyway. You want to tell me how you really feel? No. This is from James. Um, now, the way he says this, uh, he means primer and repercussion. No, read it. What is the cutoff no, date? No, read it. What? I it am reading says, it. says, what is cutoff oh. date pinner? What is con- cutoff date pinner pre XX before that year and post XX after that year? As I'm looking into World War II weapons of big power and weapons form from 1920s and 1930s, Thompson submachine gun and all section machine guns, e.g., Bren. Love your work on pinner and repostion modern guns which are built to 1840s pattern. So it's not really like, a cutoff uh, date we don't, we don't primers. Te- technically, we don't have a cutoff. I mean, I, I would keep it... It's called CNR still, so I'd want to keep it as you know within the CNR range. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't really want to do stuff from the 90s. Not um, yet. Not until we're old. <sighs> Just let me pretend <laughs> that they were recent. Okay. Um, I really... <laughs> I really, I think, like, I would probably cut it off about 1970 if I had to pick. Sure. Um, but not that I wouldn't go over it. It's just that there's so much for us to cover. Also, by the time we get there, I don't think we're going to make it through all the stuff before we just die. Like we. Oh, no, we're going to die without covering there's no a way. quarter of what's out oh, there. Oh, my God. We're going to be like one of those, like, mangas where the artist dies before it's done. and then they're My, only my hope is that we're inspiring over. people to care more about the details and that other research will get done. Like, I don't think it's going to be all CNR Do you think Arsenal someone forever. will pick up the CNR Arsenal reins? Some young whippersnapper? I have no clue. Yeah, no. Even clear. if CNR Arsenal and name vanished, I think the, the first of all, the notion of doing deep history has been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. And somebody else will get inspired and pick it up. I like the idea that we're kind of like the old Discovery Channel, like how it used to be. No, we're not. We're way deeper than they were. I know, but we're like... Yeah, we, the problem is, you know what it is? We're doing apolitical history. That's, uh, that's the thing true. that people are comparing us to. They're not comparing us to Discovery Channel in the sense that Discovery Channel ever had a show as in-depth as ours. Mm-hmm. They never did. We're Tales just... of the Gun was... Look, I like Tales yeah. of the Gun when I was younger, but it's frankly garbage. Like, Stop it, doing that with your toenails. The, like the visuals don't match what they're saying. Some of the history is pretty hinky. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not a lot of detail even with what's there, but it was politically neutral historical content. Right. And it wasn't reality a TV. A bit hard to come across these right. days. That's also, maybe that's why I don't like the Q&As as much either, because it's kind of a bit of reality TV. Yeah. I, don't that, really like I think that's why we tend to just both kind of not be super excited about them. But, I mean, to be fair, I like the idea that... We're giving something back to the patrons. That's really what I enjoy about it is the fact that we're we're getting like to answer stuff. It takes for them. like four days to make one of these. Well, four. It takes about I say about three days. Yeah, of three total days. Because we, he and I, it's like we're driving a car. We're not stopping. It, we started at eight thirty. It's three eighteen, and we were working before this too. Yeah. I want to point out. We if it, when do we start working? I don't know. Like It'll two? disrupt our schedule for about three days instead of three weeks. Which is way nicer. Yeah, well, I guess a week and a half. So we were able to do our uh, our we got filming to do the Drac- with Draco Draco Finale Finale without special having because of to this. stretch. And I'm honestly, for the first time, last year I didn't get to ride my motorcycle for a problem that mm-hmm. was going on with it. That over the course of an entire year, I never had a chance to take five hours to work on. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I built in two days off to hopefully get my bike fixed. Yeah. And I can't afford a new bike. So I know. It's, yeah. I know. All right, uh, we're going to take a pause. Yes, we do. Good take. All right, um, this one is from Attilite. Attilite. 
whatever. Uh, does the team at CNR still find it a struggle or burden to remain so apolitical when current firearms content, as well as the broader gun culture, has seemed to become so openly political in recent history? I mean, we have kind of talked, we have touched on this a lot throughout this. Well, okay, so the pressure is down. I don't know why, but there was a lot of pressure. Oh, but there was a lot of pressure. Move your thing forward. Give don't, me a second. Don't step on that. I'm don't step on that. Forward. Are you playing footsie with me? No. She's playing footsie. Mm -mm. Anyway. Um, why do you make that face? Weirdo. It's messed up. <laughs> I wish you looked at me like Swiss At least gun. I'm wearing socks. You're looking at me like I'm in 1882, but I feel like in 1878. Oh my God, that's really good. <laughs> if you see in the episodes, that's some good referencing right there. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> oh, apolitical. Um, I prefer to be apolitical on the show itself. Mm -hmm. So for seeing Arsenal itself, like a primer episode, no problem being apolitical. Don't yeah, care. Yeah, no. Um... When it comes to personal life, it gets very hard for me to not want to weigh in and have some of my authority come along with me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I can run an alt to talk about some stuff if sure. I want to talk about some stuff. But it would be on occasion nice to be like, no, 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 seriously, I read. Mm -hmm. Not to say that I'm, ooh, I'm with eyes, I know everything. I like the little ears. But just to sort of, yourself. to have that element of like, dude, I, I read this stuff this is what it is. This is a fact. I'm not trying to like make a, a thing out of it, but right. I'm the kind of person who is being objective yeah. here. So you're saying that like, it, you could do it, but honestly, it is not difficult for us to do primer and remain apolitical. Yeah. I just also, the bigger problem I have is I want to get in there and correct some of the conversation around yeah. certain things because guys just run their mouths. They definitely do. And it's not that I don't agree with what they are going for. Mm-hmm. But boy, they are not. Their their details are all wrong, yeah. and it's just like, hold on, you're really off the root of this, right. you know. Um, but yeah, I like not where too you're difficult going, but, though. Yeah. Um, this one's from Just Old Joe. We've seen the Caltech Sub Two Thousand, and you've mentioned uh, CCW, but other than that, I haven't heard you men much mention any of newer guns on the market. Do either of you collect any more modern firearms, or do you even have any interest in them? I have an interest in modern firearms in the sense of a utility. Mm-hmm. Like, They're pretty good tools, essentially. May's just kind of shopping around for a new CCW, actually. We yeah. haven't had a chance to get out and really test fire We've been a little um, bit to busy. her perfection. So but... it's probably going to be sometime next month. <clears throat> Suze is really hot on uh, subcompact pistols. She should almost be doing content because mm -hmm. she really likes... Actually, Suze is really big into... I think she's tried like 20-odd female-oriented concealed carry holsters and stuff like that. Yeah. Because she's very curious about different ways to carry and where to bear weight and stuff like that. Um me personally, uh, I've been stuck on my concealed carry for years. Mm -hmm. Like, I've been pretty happy with it. Yeah, you've been pretty content. Um, I get curious about certain stuff. Uh, I like poking around 3D printing stuff a little bit. Mm -hmm. I really like utility case guns. So, for me, I have, like, a normal AR setup that's very budgety. Mm -hmm. But it would work in a pinch. Yeah. And then... Um, the Caltech got me thinking about what would be a reasonable bag gun, and I kind of have I have a intermediate cartridge bag gun that I've been tinkering with lately. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much I want to publicize it though. That's fair. And then for you, you don't. I you have my little RDB oriented. that I enjoy. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You have a little Caltech RDB because I, um, I think Matt Larissa here talked you into liking those. Yeah, and then I I have enjoyed it ever since. It's been fun to just play around with. Yeah, it's a really cute rifle. You haven't taken so, it out for a little while. No, I need to take it out next time. We <gasps> you do. haven't run it out on the new range with the extra room. I have room. not. That'd be fun. Oh, that'd be fun. And yeah. then I, you know, it's not all that modern, but I like my Val. That's fine. Like, I mean, way more modern than the show, but oh, yeah. I just like. The big gun that make the big boom sometimes. Ooh, the next question is pretty good. Okay. If and uh, this is from N, literally N, the letter <laughs> N. If and when would you do a patron shoot? I don't think I could do a patron shoot. Yeah, uh, I would, would want be a to. Difficult. <clears throat> but the buy-in is too much pressure. Right. Uh, it's the same thing with our Discord. We don't have a pay for Discord. No. Our Discord is public. But Everyone's able to access it as long as they have access to the internet. There are behavioral rules there. So it's a free in and it's free out the door. And then we've had people get mad. I've actually had one or two guys just be like, well, I'm a patron. How can you do this? I'm like, 
You didn't get in here by being a patron. No, none of them did. It was free to come in here. The only the only cost of being in here was being civil, you know? And if you can't be civil <clears throat> and abide by that... Really, then... it's not even all that civil. You just have to be on topic and not necessarily going for ad hominems all the time, you know? Right. So um, we're pretty laid back with the rules, except for the fact where it's just like, keep it on topic. And then, I swear to God, people come in there who are determined to get... Almost everybody that's ever been removed from that server was determined to get removed from and that server. And very few people have been removed, actually. And they've gotten removed by coming in and explicitly trying to be a distraction. Mm -hmm. And demanding the attention. Yep. And I'm going to be honest, a lot of it is that they just, they want daddy's attention. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, guys, looking for like, you're, you're just looking for attention. I'm not giving it to you. Mm -hmm. And if, if you continue to do it when I'm ignoring you, I'm just going to boot you out. Right. Like, I just don't... I don't there are other it. servers you can go to. But the same exact problems would show up on a shoot, only with live ammo and huge liability. Yeah. So, um, instead of doing it as a patron shoot, I would like to do a shoot. David and I have talked about it. We'd like to do a shoot, especially after we were in Pennsylvania recently and saw sort of the restrictions people were putting up with on what they were doing. Oh, God, yeah. Um, you know, those guys had really cool old rifles that can shoot out to a you know, crazy distance. And none of them could shoot uh, and play with any of the stens that David brought. <clears throat> yeah, that so they weren't they weren't able to play with the sort of the, the high-speed stuff, but also um, they weren't really able to stretch out their rifles where they were at. Right. And a lot of those guys, you know, especially packed in the Northeast like that, they really don't have access to, you know, something like 700 yards. I don't know that... For a, for a more open shoot, I don't know that you could get more than 500 yards of utility out of most people. Uh -huh. uh, if you're specifically doing long range, of course, you could go over 1,000 yards because those guys are set up for it. Right. But I think I think once you've got 700 yards, that's that's many people would be surprised at how well they could shoot at that distance if they had the opportunity mm -hmm. and a little bit of practice on it. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'd like to do a shoot. And weirdly, as much as we've been World War One focused, I almost kind of feel like I'd like to do an antique shoot. Mm -hmm. um, but the way to do that would be to start it as sort of like an invitation event. And then you get that sort of core group in. And then like ones you trust to actually test the event out for you. <sighs> yeah. But then also a lot of them would probably form executive positions in the next attempt at the shoot. Sure. And so you just sort of have to build it up slowly until you could make it an actual public event. Because you'd have to have that body of volunteers there for the event. Exactly. So uh, it's not that we can't do it. David and I have already started thinking about how to do it. But right now we're still working on some very basic flooding issues on one side of the range and yep. blah, blah, blah. So we'd have to have the facility sort of better in place. Also, currently there's like no bathrooms at the range. Right. And people cannot handle that. Nope. Like groups of people cannot handle no bathroom. I don't know what that is, but yeah. Fair. Okay. All right, this next one is from uh, Dialonius Monk. I think okay. I pronounced that correctly. If you suddenly had an extreme amount of disposable income and an extreme amount of open and available space. Um, not time, though. Space. Huh. Maybe he means time? Oh, keep going. Uh, what is the first tool or toy you would buy? Uh, aircraft hanger. Yo, right. Yeah, like that would be giant amazing. Like, just giant slab floor steel like, building yeah even even flooring yeah really even flooring they're done like that would be that then would be i would amazing. fill it with so much crap it's true like i just i mean i'd set up a gunsmithing so section yeah. i'd set up a little studio so that we wouldn't have to tear this room apart every time we wanted to film mm -hmm. like yeah no if i had like room in the middle of nowhere i would plop down an outbuilding and I would just like, just a, I would a set up, giant a, I building. would have a whole rig out for just boiling and conserving the firearms, you know, all of the Mark style, That'd right? would be amazing. I'd have a little gunsmithing corner for doing repairs. Mm -hmm. I'd have all sorts of bins set aside so that I could leave stuff in mid-projects. And you'd have like TIG setups and all sorts of things. Yeah, I'd end up doing the micro welding stuff for mm -hmm. Henry to work out of. Like, oh no, it'd be, I'd set up a set. It'd be baller. Yeah, that's what I would do. Yeah. That's an instant. Mostly, the, seriously guys, is. We just have such small space and availability to put stuff we, in. We literally live and work in only 1,100 square feet, which mm -hmm. is not a lot. No. Uh, especially for how we've had to creep up on it. We have a little tiny garage that can't keep up. We've been gearing we, up for a shed to um, get set up with that. We've already got that process kind of started. We're sort of. We got, like, we got a guy to talk to and we've got some stuff, but it's like it's still going to take a lot of money and we don't always have it. Time. Yeah, but luckily not yeah. a lot of time on our end as far as the uh, Yeah, setup. we're trying to get enough money to pay another guy to do that, but we're struggling to afford like an outbuilding, like 10 by 10 outbuilding. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? 
Um, well, actually, I was hoping more like 30 by 10 if I can pull it up. But um, space is everything to us right now. And if I'm honest, we might have been able to pull off not spending as much on the show directly mm -hmm. and shifting it over to our incomes. It's all how we have to report our taxes and everything. But anyway, the short answer is we probably could have taken less into the business and more into our personal accounts for a year or two and then had our taxes look good enough to go to get a better piece of property, mm -hmm. except for the fact that while all this is going on, when we finally start having some money flow, what happens? The price of property here skyrockets completely out of control to the point that- So then that if you were to sell your property to acquire another one with equal or, or with a greater space, that would be- astronomically priced. And we have no hope of upgrading right. at this point. CNR Arsenal does not make enough money for us to get any extra square footage out of this place. Right. Um, so the outbuilding is almost our only hope, and we're not even sure how much we can squeeze out of it. But We're going to we, try. We're dire for space. That's yeah. really the big one. This one's from Tenacious Trilobite. Uh, who is your favorite moderator on the CNR Arsenal Discord, SOP or GBF? Oh, he's trying. I know, he's trying. He's trying to be Look a bad guy. He made an he angry, made it. smiley face. I know, I copy-pasted his angry, smiley face because he was so proud of himself. And he even talked in the Discord chat. He even showed a screenshot of his question being like, Look, I'm going to start some shit. Do you know that those guys, by the way, um, this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. They technically have mod powers, but they're not moderators per se. That's true. Because they do almost nothing. Mm -hmm. It's only when someone's really screwing around right. that they step in. So there's sort of like a blowout valve, right? Mm -hmm. um, GBF and SOP got their positions, uh, and I didn't know who they were necessarily. Mm -hmm. They got them by being extremely plugged in, handy guys that completely manifestly showed that it was in their... You're revealing the secrets, but why would you reveal the secrets? Maybe what, because it would be really hard to mimic this. Well, in their case, like these are two guys that have repeatedly shown that they had that their interest is in promoting the showing community, mm -hmm. right? They enjoy it. They enjoy who's there. They're nice guys, right? Um, and especially like GBF, especially is a notorious troll and asshat mm -hmm. in many other places on the internet. Oh yeah, he's like, uh, I, I, anyway, he hit the the on like he's the kind of guy that uses trip code on 4chan, uh -huh. right? Um, which is Makes him a pariah there too, but he uh, he gets it that he, the our Discord doesn't reject him for being edgy. No, but you got to keep it on topic, right. and you can't target somebody. No, it's all we care about. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, and it's so it's such an interesting thing that that's the person you would choose for a mod, right? Right. Um, but. They're both cool dudes. Yeah. And both of them have gone other ways for me personally. So I would, there's not much of, like, if either of those guys were in the hospital, we'd miss an episode. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I would be driving across the country to check out my homie in the hospital, and there would be an episode missed. Mm -hmm. So picking between the two of them was almost impossible. SOP, just for people who don't know this, there was a, um, we had a really weird hand trap called the Perfector yep. that we ordered out of Britain and we got ripped off because it was seized by eBay's international program. They refunded us our money. They refunded the seller his money somehow, and then it vanished. Yeah. And they just said it was some forbidden object. And it's like, it's a hand trap? Right. And so... And the only thing we think it was maybe they... Thought they, it was a manacle or something? Yeah. Um, so Sop got obsessed with the fact that this got ripped away from us. Mm -hmm. So he managed to get enough of a look at one from photos and stuff online. Yeah. That he went and had, uh, he designed and had laser cut a head for one. Mm -hmm. He grabbed a hold of one of the other guys that's really cool on the server. Doc, yep. yeah. Doc, who's, um, we actually managed to meet him at Show Shows. I love Doc. Yeah, who's Hi, this bud. guy? Hey. He didn't even want to give me a hug at first. I know. Um, and then he didn't <clears> hang out <throat> even longer. He left us. Yeah, so Doc AV put- Damn it, Doc. Or Doc Volt, not AV. Uh, Doc, Doc Volt uh, put um, a, uh, he did the hand the turning wood. for the, yes. the wood handle. They got all fitted out and rubbered up, and then they sent it over to me. And it's beautiful. But they labeled the Imperfector because it's a slight I know, game. it's great. So um, we have that for the Hand Trap series, and we get to try it. I can't wait. Um, but we can't until we get Kevin over here, Kevin. Mm -hmm. um, Kevin. And then for GBF, GBF was the one that there was an auction an hour and a half away from him that refused to ship. Mm -hmm. But they had the... Uh, but the, the, the revolver that looks like a bodeo that has a glacenti inside. Mm -hmm. And I said, dude, I really want this thing. Is there any way I can bribe you into doing this? And he's like, bribe me. I'll just go do it. Mm -hmm. So he just went and snagged it for me. Yeah. And then, I mean, I paid him back. Also, but, he's lent us pieces, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Stop, I've had, yeah, they've lent us stuff. But the point is, like, 
I mean, he drove to go to an auction just to putz around and bid on something for right. me. Right. Like, that's so friggin' cool. I like, know. I, there's not much I want to do for those two. So, I know. there. So, you're friends. not going to pick your favorite. So also, that's... you're not getting your gun back just for that question. Because <laughs> we forgot to ship it this week. No, it wasn't supposed to ship out. This... Wait, did you tell him this week? No. I was about to say, I told him we'd ship it sometime this end of the month. I'm... Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, well, it's the end of next month now. <laughs> next question. <laughs> next month. Uh,. Yeah, we can fit it in. This one is from Randy. Othias, you are a very, no, you are very good at figuring out and repairing old firearms. Are you self-taught or did you have some kind of training? First of all, I only share my successes. It's true. No, I, um. <laughs> you share your, is, the patrons know all about the successes and failures. It's a combination of self-taught and I, I honestly, I try to listen to everybody I talk to. That's true. So, um, you know, I hung out with Mark. There's stuff that he does that I'm like, mm, but there's stuff that he does that I'm like, ooh, so... I've I borrowed a lot of That's just the sounds he goes mm -hmm. I borrowed a lot of from Mark. I follow a lot of guys that do their own gunsmithing. I talk to them, I ask them questions about what they think about things. I have friends that are welders and things. Mm -hmm. So like I really try to listen to the best advice of the people around me. And then I'm very, very cautious, cautious and patient. Mm -hmm. And so the truth is I don't repair a lot of firearms. They sit there and wait and wait and wait. Uh, I had a Webley Mark VI that was a personal firearm of mine that ultimately didn't get used because it was out of time m many years ago. And mm -hmm. it was sitting inexpensive. You know, it was inexpensive. It's been sitting around. And then very recently, I was like, oh, yeah, that was out of time. And since that date, I had learned how to do the timing better. I didn't monkey with it at the time because I didn't know how to fix the timing issue. So you, just, then, you were patient and let it sit until you had the skills. We needed it for the drag thing. So I was just like, oh, yeah, I guess I better repair that. Right. So I brought it out and I was like, I know exactly how to fix this now. And I did it. And that was it. So I just didn't. I, I just did what I knew how to do when I knew how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I worked up slowly and I paid attention. And then I tried out stuff on, frankly, junk with little to lose. And it's... It's gone well. I have to say, knock on wood, I have not actually broken a firearm by trying to repair it. Correct. Because I am so patient about what I'm going to do and you where my limits are. You go patient, you go slow, you assess, and then continue on. Yeah. Uh, fun thing, if anybody's curious about that, we'll get to it after. Let's go ahead and take a pause and I'll tell you the fun thing. Okay. All right. So what's the fun thing? This is the most convenient revolver today. E okay. What's the fun, the fun thing? thing? Well, these are almost always messed up. Mm -hmm. So uh, these double action Smith and Wessons tend to have bad sears and hammer surfaces. It's where the sear and the hammer interact. Sure. Uh, people go in and hand file them, and the interaction, the fit was so tight on these in terms of the angles mm -hmm. that if you get it wrong, the hammer just overrides the sear because it's a really bad sear to hammer angle. It's it's they just did a bad job of it. Fair. Um, so I keep finding these in bad condition. My buddy Doc had one that was in bad condition. I found two of these in bad condition at a gun show. Mm -hmm. I managed to cobble together one working one. And then I've got a buddy of ours doing micro welding on the sears to see if we can actually recover sears. That's yeah. a whole experiment. But in this particular gun, I did a number of things to fix the timing, to fix the hammer, to fix the firing pin that I've learned sure. over the years. Sure, okay. But one of the things I've learned is that a lot of times you have this setback on the cylinder mm -hmm. and you can take a shim off. You can make a shim out of plastic, like off of a milk jug or something. I've mentioned it before. Mm -hmm. This one needed shimming. It needed to kind of have the cylinder held to the rear a little bit more. But I realized David now has a laser, like a really good laser. Laser. Mm -hmm. Ooh. So I thought about it and I went, wait a second. So I figured out what I needed by taking a feeler gauge and figuring out what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I ordered that thickness of shim stock for like 20 bucks mm -hmm. and then i just sent straight over to david's house and when he's like we got it he's like why do i have the shim stock and i was like i need a circle with an id of x and an od of y mm -hmm. which is a very small can't be done by hand at all right and he just punched it out in the laser and then he thought about it he's like i'm gonna do that like like three percent bigger and five percent bigger in mm -hmm. case he's off a little bit. And he right. was right. The 3% bigger dropped right in because I had missed one measurement that I didn't think about dropping it in. Mm -hmm. And so, like, Friday, he just brings me a three little tiny wafers. Uh -huh. I shove one in, screw it in. And then this thing is in perfect time now with no no awesome. shift. Back and, and it's just like, oh, technology is cool. Because, I mean, if you're at the gun show, cool. I mean, you could barely see the shim. And it's just like. Perfect. Oh, that's Done. rad. Yeah. So, uh, long story short, if you need to shim a revolver and you have a feeler gauge, those come in handy. Uh, yeah. Maybe t I'll I'll tell David and he can <laughs> charge you ten bucks to cut one. Because like I'm sorry, it's to, to cut this. It, for him, it's nothing. 
But at the same time, I would pay like 40 bucks right. to have somebody else do that because um, actually I might pay more if I really needed it because like to have one that's just well myself, done laser cut. It's yeah, perfect. Never, yeah. It's steel. It's never going to be a problem. It's right there. It's not a plastic one that's going to wear out and smoosh. Yeah. No, no, no. That was awesome. And yeah. it's so like for him because he has the very expensive laser. It looks laser, neat on so top of that because yeah. it wasn't hand cut. So yeah, nice. Yeah, I like it a lot. So there's been a lot of stuff like that too where I've been like, oh, wait a second. I can use this. Mm -hmm. So um, we're actually, we've got a buddy that's trying to get into micro welding. We're sending off a test piece to this company. They're supposed to send us back one. And I may use some of my money to front him to do the rig. And if he can get good at it, he'll pay me back as he does work. Nice. But I need a micro welder. I can't find anybody that does it. But we got a guy that wants to learn. So sometimes you just throw your weight behind your homie. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work out. But it's the best way to kind of keep, by all means, guys, invest in helping your homies get into this stuff so that we can keep the ball moving. We don't want to lose this talent or oh, the, yeah, no. the ability to have the talent, you know? So. Um, next question though. War Geek, has primary percussion in its uh, trap God. make you appreciate more modern firearms or is it a case of nothing new under the sun? Well, why would it make us, oh, just because of all the Yeah, because of the troubles with the old stuff. Well, it's a trap has nothing to do with much. No, not really. But repercussion and primer, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, just because of how things will just run. or Especially you... because of World War One focus, I don't want to use any of that old stuff no. to defend my life. Like, no. I'm sorry, guys, it's cool stuff. I know some of you are mill cert collectors and you kind of fantasize about defending whatever with whatever, but like I said earlier, I have a, I have a perfectly plain Jane AR mm -hmm. that I will use even above, by the way, my foul's cool, but I'm not reaching for my foul. It's a very inefficient design in some ways, you know? Right. I mean? uh, not that it won't run, but it's just, it's not the first thing I'm reaching for, right? Sure. Um, no, I'm going to go with something that I know runs well that shoots very flat, you know, those sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, similar decision on my bag gun. It's a fairly modern firearm yeah. that I've worked up. And then my my handgun is, you know, that I carry every day is a modern handgun. And then in terms of parts replacement and stuff like that or modifications you can make to it, that's, yeah, pretty, the triggers, that's a lot easier. The, the, I can get trigger jobs done. I can do whatever the case may be. Yeah. But, you know. You don't have to put a weird shim and a crag to make a trigger nicer honestly the biggest stuff with the newer things is a combination of flat shooting optics ready and weight yes like weight is a huge one that people don't really think about mm -hmm. or in some cases compactness is also something that doesn't really exist right. in the older stuff yeah so no you can really tailor a firearm these days they're very modular very nice and then uh guido is the next one uh, i'm just going to go with the top question uh how are your motorcycles doing uh, I think we actually covered that by accident, yeah, we did. which is that, uh, not well, not well at all. And you have built in some time to start some repairs on them soon. I'm actually going to be liquid. I had a couple, this is way long ago, yeah. but, um, they've been in storage for a while. In the deep South, you could, you could buy super cool Japanese bikes for hundreds of bucks because they weren't Harleys. Right. So I had a couple sitting in the garage and I moved them over to the storage unit. I'm getting tired of paying for a storage unit. So those are getting sold. Yes. And I'm downsizing because it's just like, I'll never have the time to fix it. So it's like. I have a super rad, like, KZ 1100, mm -hmm. and I'm just never going to get to work on it. Nope. Like, it's just, it's we like realize we just don't a have the paint time. job, some fork seals, and a carb job away from being awesome. And it's just like, mm, it's just going to have to go out the door. Right. And I spent so little money on it, you know. But. Yep. All right. Uh, next one is from Jacob. How has each of your personal enjoyment in creating Primer changed as you've moved away from a strictly Great War series to a more generalized series? How do you feel about it? Well, um, honestly, I like that the pressure is kind of off as far as being stuck in the Great War stuff. So the we fixed, don't fix list is because gone. the fixed list was really difficult for us to keep to as we started getting into more difficult to acquire firearms and weirder cartridges that then David had to create. That was a lot on all of us. Yeah, we're still doing weird cartridges and firearms, but right. we get to do them at our own pace, and we can pull in whatever we need to pull in to make a gap. Uh huh. Um, I actually, if you haven't noticed, I've kind of been loosely focusing around walking things backwards into the 1880s and 1870s, mm -hmm. maybe even the 1860s. Yeah. Um, but that's just because most of my research is still geared in that direction. Mm -hmm. And it also allows us to sort of more immediately fix some things we didn't get to cover well in detail. Right. So we talked about the Tranters recently. Um, I'm going to be able to use that to talk about, I'd really like to talk about Adams, Tranter, mm -hmm. then Early Webley. And then redo our Webley Service Revolver episode. Mm -hmm. And by the time I have that set done, yeah. the 
the the understanding that went into the Webley service episode is uh-huh. going to be radically different than the original episode. Not that there's anything all that wrong in that episode, but it's going to be so much more improved in terms of your understanding. Oh, cool. And I really like that aspect about being able to leave uh, World War One. is that for some stuff, I get to go back mm-hmm. and be like, hold on, you really don't know where this came from. And then for other stuff, when we get to go forward, which we haven't really gotten to do yet, right? we're going to get to say, hey, look where this came from. Uh-huh. Um, generally, I'm leaning towards doing some 1920s like auto pistols and stuff like that. That'd be cool. Um, not a lot happens in the rifle world in that period. Mm-hmm. And then overall, I think we're just going to start seeing machine guns whenever I can get a hold of one and have the time to get the anime. we got to solve the animation problem, but... Um, so machine guns might actually lag behind, believe it or not, because we might have an animation issue. Right. But we'll find out. I got to talk to some guys. We got to see. So, um. But overall, in general, feel a lot uh, less pressure. Yeah, I can breathe easy because at this point now, if if all hell breaks loose. um, Worst case scenario. There's, there's stuff laying around here or in my friend's collections in town. It would just be a matter of acquiring the research material. Yeah, but even that, some of it, I already had the research material from days go when, I, past, yeah, when yeah. I had the collection so um it's a big weight off in that i don't have to do sort of nine month planning i only have to do like three month planning right so not too bad yeah all right this next one is from june can we see both your ccw and carry knives uh, yeah. yeah we kind of uh, it's a little bit personal that's a bit more yeah yeah i mean I've, i think i've already said i carry like uh, 75 compacts but I'm not going to get into, like, if I show it, I don't know. It this seems feels weird. a bit weird, yeah. Um, Knife-wise, do you, are you carrying a knife lately? Not lately, no. I haven't been carrying a knife because I'm shopping for a new one, so it's kind of been on my mind to try to find one. I need to go back to that knife store that we found, the big one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's pretty right, good. Right. No, the... um. You had a stubby razor for a while. That was pretty good. The, I like the shape of that blade, but the, the actual... Uh, width of it was too big, so I'm looking for something a little different now. I haven't settled into something I want. You have like the shape of your uh, knife you have been carrying recently, though. Yeah, I had. Um, Act I like you've got I it don't on have it on me. Right? Yeah, I have. Uh, oh God! Actually, weirdly, I think it's a CRKT. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I might be wrong, but it's the one with the faux tortoise shell, and it's got like a. Uh, you like the knife shape, though. That was what you really like. But that's it. Yeah, so the I got this knife because I just wanted to try out the opening mechanism because it had, like, an old-school, like, uh, razor, like a like a razor razor. Yeah. It had an old-school razor open handle, and I was like, that seems kind of fun to play with, and I haven't figured out the knife I want. And I ended up carrying it longer than I thought I would because it was a cheap knife, like 25 bucks. Mm-hmm. And um, I've ended up carrying it longer than I thought simply because I really liked the sheep's foot. Mm-hmm. Like a lot. I've noticed that, yeah. I really am a fan of sheep's foot blade. Mm-hmm. The problem is you can't get a sheep's foot in. I tend to be a huge fan of the axis locks. Mm-hmm. Like the Benchmade axis locks. I'm feel a fan so of axis good. locks. I love the axis locks. I like spring assist. They're quick and easy and I like them. But um, Benchmade doesn't have anything I want right now. No. That's the short answer. It's Benchmade. The edge. Um, but I. Um, if I could get like an axis lock sheep's foot, I would be so happy. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, even if they did that, it would be like black plastic with no sole. Oh, yeah. And I like wood scales, or in this case, the faux tortoise shell. Yeah, that was oh, it's a Gerber. Nice. It's not a CRT. Yeah, it's Gerber. It's Gerber. 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 Yeah, it's a Gerber with faux tortoise shell scales and a sheep's foot blade with like mm-hmm. a. Anyway, uh, everybody that's seen it has really liked the knife, but mm-hmm. I've been slowly beating it to death, and uh, I'm probably going to need to replace it, but I just It can't. is a $25 knife. Yeah, there's that. Mm-hmm. But um, I just, sheep's foot blade is coming so handy. Yeah. So, um, and then I also have started carrying, like, a uh, multi-tool on my other hip, you know? I know. You've been enjoying that, I can tell. And on the rare occasion that I need something pointed, I can do the slower multi-tool open. Mm-hmm. But the multi-tools never have a sheep's foot. They always right. have some other Everything blade else, type. yeah. So, that's, there you go. And then the next one from Henry, what are Athias May and Tula's carry? I mean, Tula carries a tennis ball. In her mouth constantly. Yeah. She and does then, seem to prefer the smaller ones these days. You wouldn't recommend your carry right now. Not really, because I'm Which is another reason another not to one. name it. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty dated and you're not happy with it. I'm shopping right so. now. You do carry, but I not. do. Yeah. Every day. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Sometimes in the house, just because I forget to take it off. <laughs> Um, this next one's from James. Uh, the simulation has, I'll make sure we have the time. Yeah. The simulation has ended. You are in purgatory and as part of the relatively minor, uh, penance, you have to pay to earn entry into the metaverse. 
big cushy headphones are going to be glued to your head so you can judge other creator or content creators. If you were forced to choose between podcasts, would you choose Lex Fridman or Joe Rogan? I don't know who Lex Fridman is. He's um Do I think he's I forget who he is, but I feel like between the two of them, Lex would yell less. So I'd know. probably go with Lex just because he yells less. He's like a scientist. Does Joe Rogan? Yeah, yell? he's a computer scientist. Lex Fridman. Yeah, he he yells. He yells a lot. Hold on, I gotta take a brief moment to figure out who this is, so it's a good time for a pause. Okay. All right, so we did a Google. I'm trying to Google. Yeah, I mean. Apparently I would have to listen for a while to understand anything from him, so. For Lex, that is. Uh, I, the problem is I've never heard it. Yeah. So I guess I have to go with Joe Rogan, because I have heard Joe Rogan, and sometimes it's interesting. And even if it's not interesting, at least it's entertaining. That, I guess I that is the point. At least he would be entertaining no matter what, even if you disagree. I think that's why Joe Rogan's popular is because he's at least entertaining. I mean, he's been on a lot of TV shows and like, reality shows. <laughs> Alex Jones and Joe Rogan is like nuts. And then, but I mean, I've even, I've definitely seen one where it was just a guy talking about sort of um, uh, Earth's uh, geology and things like that. Uh -huh. So it'd be entertaining. The problem is I looked up Lex Fridman and apparently he's MIT computer science test kind of guy. Mm -hmm. But I just haven't heard anything of his and there's not enough time for right. me to listen. I'd have to try an episode or two to see. I have a feeling it's probably more narrowly focused. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong, but it's probably more narrowly focused than Joe Rogan and as much as I, you know, you want to seem like cerebral and pick the highbrow thing, mm -hmm. whoever's got the larger variety of topics is going to be the one I pick because I don't want to go crazy. That's fair. Like, I mean, if you have to listen to him for a while, I'm assuming. Yeah. All right, next question from Jake. A hypothetical. In order to get back in the black for the show, you decide to take up the grand southern tradition of amateur professional wrestling. Between Matthias and May, who's the manager, who's in the ring, and what's your gimmick? Um, hmm. I feel like I'd be better as the manager. You should be in the ring. Bullcrap, bikini, and mud. Oh, that just defeated that entire scenario I had in my head. Yeah, that would be better. Yeah. You should be in the bikini. In the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're gonna pay more to watch you wrestle than me. That's true. They said to get back in the black. If it's just for the excitement, sure, okay, I'll try some wrestling. Yeah, but, like, but to get back nobody, in the black, we're not we're making desperate. we're okay. not making any money on Matthias wrestling. Not only that, but the, you would have to wrestle other women, and I feel like you could do it. I think I could. You are very violent. I, I could try. Yeah. You're just upset that you uh, reached for something hit by hip and hurt your thumb, and it's still been hurting. Yeah, you long. broke my thumb. Probably. Probably accidentally broke. He re to be fair. You knocked I was, food out of my hand. I was flailing like I do, and it's his fault for coming near my flailing. No, arms. I was going through a doorway like a normal person, and then you decide to dive through it to be cute, and in doing so, you slap the food out of my hand. Which he saved. He rightfully saved the food. Yeah, while smashing my thumb. But he still saved the food. Yeah, that but even actually, even without the mud joke, like no, you're definitely if if I go up you against think because I can I can play it up. I'm like a fat idiot. Yeah. And I've never been athletic in my life. Mm -hmm. You're an athlete. I mean, I did ath athlete stuff. Athlete stuff. I'm just saying people would be more financially interested in you because you'd win and be attractive. Also, I'd have a good backstory. I'd oh, I'd try to change it up. I'd be all like, they took my job. That's not changing it up. That's the standard. Yeah, I know. No, but then like one day, like my dog, they took my dog. No. Like, yeah. Okay, this next no. one's from Mike. Uh, what's your favorite barbecue sauce? Any recipe? Well, Carolina mustard. He likes Carolina mustard, Carolina yes. Carolina mustard. We both like it. It's the best. Um, I have Carolina mustard. different sauces, though, for different Carolina things. Carolina mustard. I make a hash. with. I make that hash, that hash that you loved, not with a Carolina mustard. I told her I loved it, even though it wasn't Carolina mustard. I made it with not a Carolina mustard, and he loved it. So, so I guess he great. can like other mustards. Yes. To be fair, there were other ingredients in that, too. Also, hash takes forever to make. Did you know that? I wish I had a recipe it for takes good a Carolina. Long I actually time. need to probably figure out a good recipe for Carolina mustard. Yeah, at this point. Because I'm not winning that <laughs> fight. It's a dying I mean, art. Uh, Swing and Swine had a, has a decent one now. They had a de it's, well. They have one that I would consider in the realm of a Carolina mustard. Like mm -hmm. it's certainly a oh, Carolina so mustard. It's just, look, look no, it's not. It's feeling. not excellent, but it is a. It is at least not a Carolina stew. It's not a fake honey mustard. It is a Carolina mustard. Uh -huh. I give them that. Okay. But we were there the other day, and they had a special. As part of the special, they had hog sauce with it. Uh huh. Which was clearly their Carolina mustard, but with something else in it, and I'm not sure what it was. Hog. But it was a modification of their Carolina mustard, <laughs> and it was way better than their normal Carolina. Like, it was actually, like, 
It was like it, a, it was a it was I a high performing much. Carolina mustard sauce. I don't like high performing Carolina mustard sauces. Yeah, which is why to be fair, you're I can do honey mustard. So. <laughs> 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 anyway. Uh, Christian says, as much as you guys love living in the South, if you had to move to a northern state, where would it be? That's a funny joke. I'd rather die. Well, there are some states that aren't as terrible for gun laws. So if you had to pick somewhere, I'm assuming... Wait, Death. hold on. Northern state. What does it mean by northern state? Does that mean we get to pick, like, above the middle of the United States? North of the Mason-Dixon. Pick... Okay. There are states south of the Mason-Dixon I won't live in. Right. Which is all of them north of me. <laughs> um, what about, was Maine not bad, I want to say? Am I, am I remembering wrong? What's, there's like one northern state that's really weird for all the other northern states. There is! For like gun laws. It's actually a really weird one. I think it used to be Vermont, but it's gotten bad. Oh, uh, okay, it's gotten bad. I mean, to be fair, there was only a matter of time. To be fair, it's not just about gun laws. You do know what else is there. I know. Coles. I don't do well in the cold. Do you know how much I need? You're trying to cover Southern it. temperature? No, yeah. I'm not covering. This is just for me. You can tell your own damn story. But for me, I thrive in the heat. I love the heat. I hate the cold. The cold hurts. So I don't do cold. That was my TED Talk. I wear jackets in 60, 70 degree weather. And a lot of people can attest to that. I wear jeans to the range in 100 degree weather because I'm comfortable in that. Although right now I'm wearing capris and I'm cold. The North is a containment zone for Yankees, so the rest of the world doesn't have to suffer them. And they move here anyway. Uh, well, it's true. We have good food. They figured it out. Go back. If you ask for a medium rare burger or steak, you get a medium rare burger or steak here. They done shit up the place and then they came down here. You have to ask for here. rare up there in order to get something that's possibly medium. <laughs> what is that? Do they not understand? Am I missing something? Is there a language that has been now created? Like, is there a different word for medium rare up there now that I'm just not familiar with? Do you have to like point to a container of pasta sauce and be like, that color, right there. Give me this color. Just bring it out. I'll, I'll heat it on a little Bunsen, Bunsen burner or something, you know? Yeah, okay. Um, Anyway, David asks, how many Carolinas... <laughs> we just seriously can't give an answer, can we? No. <laughs> how many Carolinas are too many? What? How many Carolinas are too many? What? I don't know what that means. I don't know. I mean, there's North Carolina and South Carolina. Yeah, there's two. Should there be another Carolina? Maybe he's saying there should not only be... Maybe he means that is what more than one Carolina. No. Too many. Oh, God, that would ruin us. If there was still one United Carolina, those idiots up there would have ruined our entire That's state. true. They would have. Yeah. No, they can be two. They, they stay over two. there. Yeah. That's, that's, it, we, it turns out it was a good idea to separate them out because yeah. they're horrible people. Uh -huh. They got the North right in there. Yeah. That's how you know they're wrong. And even Northern Carolina people, the, the good ones anyway, they apologize for being in North Carolina. You know it's not the South because it says North in their name. We have some friends up in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. We tease them for being there too. living in that dumb place. They take that teasing. And they end up not being able to pay the tab at the Mexican restaurant that they tried to go to because he brought the one man who speaks Spanish. Ha ha. He got you. <laughs> not everybody listens to the podcast. They have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I mean, oh, yeah, that's true. The whole, this isn't for patrons. This is not. Well, he might see it. This is for it. public consumption. Jim might see it. He, okay. he watches the show. Okay. Jim, we got you. How does it feel? After all these years, we finally got you back and I wasn't there for it. So I'm a little sad. But ha ha. Anyway, this is uh, next one is for Jason. Uh, soup like life or like like soup? So I thought this was supposed to be like soup like life uh, or uh, what Do is these it? words have meaning? Yeah, yeah, what is I think it's something like uh, if life is like a soup, eat it with a spoon, not a fork. Or I forget what? the exact saying that it oh, is. No, it's I basically to, am I googling this. Yeah, you can Google it, but that's the saying that I thought it was was soup. Life be a spoon, is like not a, a fork, yeah. When life is like soup, be a spoon, not a fork? But my thing is, so here's my take on that. I say, I like to take the extra time to make some rice, add to the soup, and then I can eat with whatever I damn well please. I can have a fork, spoon, or chopsticks for all I, I feel can. Like because I'm, really... I'm taking the time to make it heartier and better with the addition of rice. I am missing some So I'm context. taking more time to make my soup 
better. I think I'm having a stroke. I don't know what. This I think means. it's just like freaking go with. Do you, don't go against the grain of life. Like go with the easier path. No, that's stupid. Right, that's what I'm saying. That's what but my that interpretation of it is. That has to do with spoons and forks. That doesn't have to be like soup. No, it's telling it's telling you to not be the nail that stands up. I think. I think it's telling you it's, that's being like that you know. doesn't make any sense. Like it's it says soup like life or life like soup. There's no mention of forks and spoons. Oh yeah, no, that's other. that's why I think that the, that was the only thing I came up with was the soup with the fork and the spoon. I don't know what that's all about. I'm completely confused. I mean, I, I in general to, I mean, enjoy soup a lot, actually. I like broccoli and cheese I need more soup. explanation. Okay. Uh, I, I consider up. chili a soup, depending on what you don't add to it. If you don't add rice to it, I consider it soup. If you add rice to it, then you've just made a one-pot meal, which is fantastic. Anyway. Right. Uh, hold on. I gotta double-check this. So read the next one, because I don't know what this oh, is. Oh, it's a quote from a movie. Um, oh, really? What's yes. it from? What movie is oh, it from? Oh, so uh, basically... A uh, general, hold on, is asking, have you ever seen a Kame drink a glass of water? Nah, they don't drink glasses of water. They drink vodka. But think about it. Your body's made up of 70% of water, okay? I have no idea what is Your body's going made on. up of 70% of water. Uh, you need Strange water Love. in order to survive. You're replenishing yourself, right? I haven't so seen Dr. Strange Love drink, in so long, I don't even remember this You don't need to scene. drink water. What does that make him? Not people. Not people. Are you repeating the scene, or am I just completely confused? Oh, uh, I mean, I'm just, like, he goes on for, like, minutes. Well, it's, like, two minutes and some change, but essentially, yeah, it's a whole thing of, like, you need the water to replenish yourself. I say, the earth is made up of 70% of water. So are you. You're made up about the same amount. Like, he goes in this whole thing with it. The guy's sitting there and be like... <laughs> yeah, it's it's really weird. You should watch the movie. It's actually watch. a pretty good movie. I've, sh I've watched it before, but I honestly don't. It's been so long. It's like another lifetime ago. I actually literally haven't seen, uh, I think I've seen like three movies, like a two hour movie mm -hmm. since we started the show. I know. Like it's, I mean, if you're, it's been a long time since I've seen it too. I just remember that as one of the scenes. It's like from uh, also another movie like Streetcar Named Desire. I can maybe remember a few very specific scenes in that movie, but everything else is kind of a blur. All right, so All right, um, GBF. GBF, yeah. GBF got a question in. Uh, you've been given a time machine, um, but can only use it once, i.e. one full trip whenever and back again. How do you use it? Also, no time paradoxes. You can't directly interfere with your own self nor become your own grandpa. Damn, I like the idea of becoming your own grandpa. Um, I know what you would do. What? Your dad with the ear picks. No, <laughs> that's a separate thing. No, I think... Um, no paradoxes. Mm -hmm. uh, in the context of C and Arsenal, okay, I would probably wait. You can interfere with me, and I can interfere with you. I would probably go to like the inner war period. Mm -hmm. Can you take something back with you? Yeah, I guess so. But I would go to the inner war period, mm -hmm. and I would wander around with as much. God, how would I do this? I'd have to find a way to bring currency back or something that was equal to currency. Mm -hmm. Anyway, if I could find a way to generate a currency to bring back, I would then travel around to all these sort of militaries and archives mm -hmm. and gather up all the damn data that got burned during World War II. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much we don't know because it burned during World War II. Mm -hmm. um, and... Before World War II, there's a fairly good chance that if you just went around and stayed connected and talked to people, like if I just went back for a couple months yeah. and really shook hands and made myself sound knowledgeable, mm -hmm. I could probably get in most places, get a translator, get shit done, get get copies of documents. Mm -hmm. Especially if I like took my cell phone with me and had you know a couple SD cards and just didn't let on because I'd be like, yeah, I just need to, I just need to get in here and then I would snap a bunch of pictures because they'd never expect me to just be able to do that. You know right. what I mean? So, I feel like um, I'd I'd try us, us to use it together. So I would I would suggest you and I go back in time together. But it says well, you have, where you, are we going? you can go back again. So I'm assuming you can choose when to come back, right? Okay. So I say we just go back like many years and start seeing Arsenal actually before when YouTube was still young. That way oh, we're, yeah, like we're right huge. At the beginning? And then oh, we can just, yeah. if we have to come back, it's like force yourself to go can, back can right you, when you're about to die. If we were like die. an early YouTube channel when they were willing to show people things. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. We'd be right? like, hot shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's a good idea. Yeah, too. see? That's better. I thought I like about that. that. You're smart. Yeah. <laughs> the brains of seeing Arsenal right here. Okay. What should be the fate of... Uh, this oh, is yeah. from Scott. Scott. Yeah. What should be the fate of people who sporterized vintage rifles? It's their gun. 
Don't really have much control over that. I'm not a fan, but uh, it's their gun. Like, sucks, but you can't... Private property, man. I have a lot of limits. All right. Yep. It really sucks. Um, Cosmic. Uh, considering pretty much every question is gun-related, I figured this one would change things up a bit. What are your favorite movies? <laughs> As I just <laughs> point out that I haven't watched... I'm going to be honest, I don't like movies. Um, yeah. I've gotten that way because I can't... If I sit down and two hours go by and nothing has been accomplished, I... Oh, I got one. What? You go ahead. You finish. I got one. That was really it. That was I was whole... just excited. Oh, okay. Um, trucks. That was my favorite. It's like basically uh, kind of like Christine, but instead of the car coming to life, 18 wheelers come to life and they go around killing people because they're really pissed off and they want their own rights. And like, there's this one chick in there. She legitimately just keeps standing in front of them screaming and dudes run want? in. I forget. They just want, I think they want just rights in general. Like they want some, they basically end up signing a peace treaty with people and getting their own rights for, I forget what, I'll, I don't remember any of that. Mostly I just didn't remember that chick who runs in front of them screaming and a bunch of dudes end up dying because they individually each go to try to save her. Then they die, but she lives. She lives in the very end. She can just lives on her life after like four people have died saving her. That really infuriated me. But the movie itself was hilarious. And that was it. It's trucks. Anyway. Uh, no, I actually almost, almost purposely avoid movies at this point, because it's just, I don't know why, but there's just never anything that accomplishes enough. I will say I have a soft spot for Wes Anderson, oh, because yeah. I feel like he doesn't waste the medium. So, most, of, most of the movies I've seen, I'm going to be honest, almost every movie I've seen could have been better as a book. Mm. Uh, or or even like an game. audio thing, like most could just be audio plays. Like, I'm great with the old radio, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you're kind of right. Miyazaki's the same way. Yeah. Um, uh, but Wes Anderson, I guess, yeah, Miyazaki, there's probably some others like that if I really stop and think about it. Right. But there's only a handful of, uh, m movie makers. Cause I don't want to just say directors or whatever, mm -hmm. producers, but the just movie makers that have that, a very good vein. No, that they use the visual to its full effect. Like, mm -hmm. they actually don't waste your time with the visual. Right. I understand there's all sorts of great things with special effects and blah, blah, blah. I don't really need it to move the story for me. Mm -hmm. But I will say Wes Anderson puts so much effort into those long shots with intricately detailed backgrounds that are dialed into human feelings mm -hmm. that the, the stories would be nowhere near as good without the visuals. Mm -hmm. It's very clear that the visuals are part of the story, mm -hmm. as to the point that the human beings are actually very dryly acted, right? Right, yeah. And then, um, although, God, man, just let Burl Mary take it easy. Like, he, yeah. looks, he looks so old now. Um, oh, he does. <laughs> too, he's a good actor, And he too. lives around here. We catch him shambling around every once in a while. You gotta stop. Everybody stop feeding Bill Murray. He needs to go home. Yeah, he does need to go um, home. So... <laughs> Go home, Bill Murray. Relax. I mean, go out. Go to the River Dogs. He owns them anyway. Yeah. But like, just he likes hanging out there. He's he's it's he's, he's free range. Relax him a little bit. Yeah. Don't. Um, <laughs> he's just gonna appear lumbering behind you and like like uh, Sasquatch. Oh, but in a picture. Anyway, th those are movies that I can't look away from the screen. I, you're right. Beat me as like he's pretty pretty too. Yeah. And it's like I can't look away from what's happening because. The, so the visual visually... is not wasted. Mm -hmm. And it's not just pretty for the sake of pretty either. Mm -hmm. It's evocative. Yeah. And I really enjoy those. Yeah, me too. Because otherwise I would just consume it as some other content. Same here. Let's take a pause for the cameras. All right. Um, next up is Beakstar. Is there something wrong with Utreon? I can't get it to play for more than a few seconds. So there's definitely something wrong with your experience. I would highly recommend sending a message to Utreon. Yep. If you send a uh, message to the support contact, you know, obviously in one of the top corners or whatever at the bottom of the screen, uh, they are very quick to respond to. They are very responsive and very helpful. So you will definitely get some help on that. Yeah. They'd ask Ed. So it might be something that's pretty much him to getting you, those emails. you're the first one to say anything. Yeah. Okay. Uh, user number 02828C, as in Charlie, 2. May Day is coming up really soon. What is the channel going to do to honor, well, he... You're the queen. The queen. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's May Day? Oh, oh right, May 1st, um, where you have a Maypole and yeah, stuff, right? Mm -hmm. No, but I think that's like International Worker Day, too, or something like that. Uh, it's gone a couple ways. It was uh, an ancient festival marking the first day of summer. Oh, 
Hmm. Was May the first day of summer? And then uh, spring Where? holiday with dances, singing, and cake. I do? Well, no, I like icing. And then you have the maypole, cake. which is supposed to be sexual, but then some people say that it's... Anyway, it's the whole thing. So, yeah, it's springtime. Mm. Um, not really. I mean, I have a... I have a... Um, I don't really... I get allergies. May hates her own birthday. Yeah. She gets I anxious hate it. I just get it. anxious around it. But in general, I just... I don't really do personal celebration days. But also... I also tend to like more pragmatic gifts and stuff like that, too. She's very hard to shop for and very easy to shop for. No, I, yeah, I will literally tell you what I want. And honestly, I grabbed her like I'm a twenty-five dollars seed spreader the oh, other day. It was so nice. And I spread some seeds. <laughs> I walked around the yard and I used my seed spreader. And then she, I had a whole conversation about how she didn't think about it, left the dial on ten. And no, just, I left it on six, and six is yeah, a bunch yeah, of seed. Just like and... dropped them right there, and I went, oh, "Okay, that was on me." But it was still really fun. I had a nice time. <laughs> See, I'm very easy to get gifts for. I would literally tell you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. But no, we don't have any particular celebration for that. Not really. Okay. All right. Sorry. We had a weird uh, cut there for the equipment, but we are back. Uh, okay. So Brian, can tell this guy is part of the Discord server. What is a McNugget buddy? Uh, on our Discord? Yeah. I did. There's always like a ranking system that you have to do because you have mm-hmm. tiers of people. Yeah. So uh, McNugget buddy, huh? Uh, we use McDonald's lore mm-hmm. for arbitrary reasons, like because I felt like it. Do you remember what made you decide on that? No, I don't remember at all. I think it was just funny. Okay. And so we have like McNugget buddies and Mac tonight, and then we have like an upgrade that's like Fry Guys. Uh huh. And then we have like Mayor McCheese mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's. <laughs> I mean, they do seem to be having fun with it. And then the guys that are in trouble get logged as Sundays. Mm-hmm. And that Sunday, creepy dog. Yeah, Sunday was this terrible, like, late 90s character they introduced that is this, like, insane-looking dog. I think he was first drawn by the same guy who drew uh, All Real Monsters. Oh, I think wow. that's where I he came from. That. Because he has this, like, he's Weird supposed to be a dog. shape with no, eyes on the same side, no, I say? No, it's not even that. He's supposed to be a dog. Uh-huh. So he has this nose with a dog nose on the end. Mm-hmm. But they didn't put... The, it, they don't actually have a nose. It's a muzzle, mm-hmm. right? And the whole thing opens if it's a real dog. Mm-hmm. But on this thing, they, like, put the nose out there and then put a mouth under it. Yeah. And it freaks me out. <laughs> and so that's what I made the punishment rule. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. I like that. We don't have a grimace. We should have a grimace. Yeah, we should. Um, let's see here. Three Lock asked, uh, what type of keyboard and mouse do you prefer for your computer? Clicky click. Well, I've got a Corsair that's red key, which I kind of like. And then my mouse I had to recently upgrade because my last Red Dragon died. So now I've got some Steel Series R5 thing or whatever. That's yeah, doing have, pretty good. I think I have the same. I think I have like Steel Series mouse. And then I think I have, I think I have blue switches. You tend to prefer blues. I prefer reds. But I'm not sure who made my keyboard. If I'm honest, like I do like to have a number pad. Yeah. Um, but I do like clicky clack because I come from that IBM generation where yeah, it's, it's just like fun. click clack click clack. And it's so fun. I do click clacks. Yeah. <laughs> um, Andre asked, "Will there ever be a public video of two of the dog enjoying being scared?" This probably comes from the podcast side of things, but we That's have a true. dog. Her yes. name is Tula. She's a hundred pound Newfoundland. There is a, she's actually been her, in a video before. And her favorite thing in the world is to be startled by somebody she likes. Yes. So She likes it when you're in the house. And you scare her. Yes. And she goes... And mm. she goes... And she runs around and wags her tail. Like, yeah. she really loves it. She likes yeah. She likes it if you play ball with her, and then, like, you throw the ball, and while she's chasing it, you go hide somewhere in the house, and then yeah. she starts coming back down the high hallway, Just and she doesn't know where you are, and she's like, uh... Just start looking behind doors. doors and stuff, trying to spot you. And you get sneaky, you can do it with somebody else, and be like, you have somebody else kind of pop out where she expects, and she just kind of wags her tail. Uh-huh. But then right when that happens, then it's like the next person comes out, like, right beside her, and goes, blah, blah, and she's... Or you can be like, I'm right behind you, and she goes, huh? And she goes, like, really wide-eyed and her tail just goes crazy and so like i gotta figure out how i would film this but sure i can try yeah we can i don't try. think it's gonna be in time for this video but no it'd probably be something we can give to the patron at some point yeah but uh we we can try just yeah keep reminding me i guess we're almost there oh there's like two questions i yeah. know unless there's like more below <laughs> i'm teasing more? all right this one is from marcus no that's it 
And then I just said the, the names I stopped with. Oh, okay. Uh, despite my best efforts... Oh, yeah, these aren't questions. These are just nice things. Despite his best efforts and being lubricated with adult beverages, he can't come up with any funny questions. So happy Easter to all you bunnies out there. Nice. So that was back when there was Easter. Yeah. And then Joshua Thanks. said, don't have a question, but do want to say he loves the channel to keep up the good work. So both Marcus and Joshua, thank you very much. I'm glad you like us. I know. We didn't even know we had the last question. And then we were at the last question. Wait, do you have a question? It's 420. So we started at like 30. So that's four hours to 1230. 130, 230, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. It's been eight hours. Yeah. That's not eight. Yeah, that's eight. Yeah, I mean, it didn't we ate a sandwich from there. We did. So it's possible so it's, it's going to cut down to about the same like... six hour ish time frame the last one did. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, we should review all this. Should let the dogs out and let them go to bed. So we got we, we got some stuff we go. We got to ask Bruno about being bootylicious. Mm -hmm. We got to get some curse words out of here. Yep. That was a good good job. Yeah, otherwise it went pretty well. Let's say there were some good questions in there, some fun questions, some ridiculous questions. But it, all in all, everyone, we appreciate the support because these all were questions that came from our patrons, who are the reason this show exists. So thank you again, and we hope we answered the questions to the best of our ability. Sorry. We didn't answer a lot of the multi-question ones just because it has taken us this long to just get through. I think the total count number on those questions was 141. So that was a quite lot. a lot of time. Now, uh, don't forget, um, if you're not a patron on Patreon, Neutron, Subscribe Star, try it out. There's a podcast every for every episode, essentially, talking about how we got there. Yep. The last one was a bitch fit. Mm -hmm. Like, I was just, I was so anxious. And uh, for anybody curious, that's under control now. Yep. Uh, hopefully on both fronts. Yeah. And then, I think that's really about it, right? Yeah. I don't think we need to go to bed. It's four in the morning. I need to yeah, go to bed. Yeah, um, I'm going to start transferring cards, but I'm probably just going to leave it as it's sitting there transferring. Oh, it's one card? Yeah. Well, that's two cards. Well, the audio transfer is much faster Do than the video. Do you want me to transfer the video? No, it's okay. Um, I can set my computer up to transfer. I'll basically set the audio to transfer, take the dogs out, and then by the time I get back, it'll probably be ready for me to transfer video. Okay, because I have to pee. It's been eight hours. Yeah. You go to I didn't go pee. I've been in this chair. I'm I haven't hungry. gotten up. I think all I had was two honey buns for dinner and two Red Bulls. It's like sugar kind. What? Okay. Well, yeah. um, this is no longer interesting. No, but so again, we're gonna thank you all. Leave. We're going to go to bed. Goodbye. <laughs>